Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone, depending on the part of the world where you are. I hope all of you are doing well. Please mute your micro when we start. So let us start this morning session with the talk by Daya Reddy on analysis and computation in solid mechanics. Please Daya, you can start. Thank you very much, uh, Norbert, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this conference. I need to share my screen. Give me a moment. Um, okay, so there we are. So my, the, the topic of my talk uh, and my area of activity is, I would say, slightly distant from the main theme of the conference. But what I'd like to do is to give you a flavor of the kind of work I do, what, uh, what the key questions are, what the techniques are, where it's located mathematically and computationally. Um, so, uh, broadly speaking, um, the area I work in involves partial differential equations and typically one would, in the context of mechanics, develop a mathematical model, uh, study it qualitatively, that is study its well-posedness, then um, because most of the time these problems are not tractable in closed form, uh, we would like to develop a procedure for obtaining approximate solutions. Uh, we also want to know something about the quality of those solutions, whether they converge to the uh, exact solution. And of course, we would like to implement them by developing algorithms um, for implementation computationally, uh, which we would also want to analyze. So that's the general rough idea of the typical research program. And what I'd like to do is to, in a sense, follow these steps by taking a model problem of um, linear elasticity with a large parameter, and the large parameter causes complications uh, from a computational point of view, which we will see later. So, okay, um, before I start with elasticity, let me just by way of brief background, go through a model problem, which I'm sure everybody is familiar with, which would be the heat equation. So the point is that you have uh, the key unknown variable, the temperature in this case, U. We have a, uh, a balance equation, a partial differential equation, which um, typifies the, uh, the behavior of, uh, of, in this case, it's heat conduction. We then have something that tells us how the heat will flow, and this will depend on the kind of material. Uh, this is Fourier's law. We put this together and we have the heat equation, which is um, first order in time and second order in space, and it's a parabolic equation. If the material is homogeneous, so that this variable k is constant, then it will look like this here. And then finally, if we have no time dependence, then we have uh, this term disappears and we have uh, the Poisson equation for steady heat conduction. So um, one can follow exactly the same steps in the context of, elas of elasticity. We have a body here which is subjected to some forces and it deforms and it takes up the shape over here. And the change in shape um, is uh, quantified through this vector valued variable, the displacement, which depends on position and in general on time. So now we have, in contrast to heat conduction, we have a vector valued um, unknown. The balance equation is the equation of motion. It's second order in time. And we have a quantity here. So this is like the heat conduction in, um, like the heat flux in the problem of heat conduction. This is the stress though, and um, it's a symmetric tensor or matrix, and we need to specify uh, the details of the material in this way over here. And now there are two constants, lambda and mu, 
which will, um, as a pair, indicate or give the properties of the material. Um, instead of just the gradient, we have what's called the symmetric gradient or the strain, uh, which is written like this here, and it looks like this in, in component form. And you also see the divergence, which would be uh, just the trace of, of the gradient. Um, then, as before, put all of this together and we arrive at a partial differential equation known as Lama's equation for the displacement, uh, which is, of course, a little more complicated than just the Laplacian, and it takes this form over here. So um, I just summarized uh, on one page here the, uh, the two kinds of the two problems um, comparing, if you like, left and right, what the steps are in the process of arriving at the PDE for the problem concerned. That, however, is not the form in which I will consider the problem. I will be approaching these problems in variational form. So if we go back to the Poisson equation, uh, it can be formulated equivalently as a minimization problem, uh, which takes this form over here. And a necessary condition for that minimum would be um, what is called this weak problem here. So find u, which satisfies this equation for all uh, functions v in a particular space. And here I'm just assuming that my function is equal to zero on the boundary. If the solution is sufficiently smooth, then one can show quite easily that um, the solution to this problem is our familiar uh, heat equation or, or Poisson equation. Uh, that's just the same thing up top there. Um, I just would like to introduce some notation in order to write this in a compact form. So I have this bilinear form here, um, grad u dot grad v integrated, and I have a linear functional on the right hand side and so the above problem in minimization form can be written like this otherwise the weak formulation looks like that. I have to, uh, well so let me just say something about the elasticity problem, same thing I'm using the same notation but the bilinear form now looks like this, I've got the lambda and mu, the two material parameters and I've got a div term and I've got the symmetric gradient term appearing as well. And otherwise it looks mathematically, it is exactly the same formulation. So um, uh, just briefly, in order to formulate the problem properly, I need to specify some relevant spaces. Uh, typically in these problems, one needs the uh, Sobolev spaces of, of um, integer form. Uh, they built from the Lebesgue spaces of square integral functions and essentially HM would be the a Hilbert space of functions which together with their de partial derivatives up to and including those of order M, and this is just all written compactly here, these are all square integral, they're all in L2. Uh, and the norm is uh, defined in this way here, so it's essentially the, the Lebesgue norm of the function and the Lebesgue norm of the uh, of all of the of all of the partial derivatives up to and including those of order m. I will stay with a homogeneous boundary condition just to keep things simple, uh, but but this basically is the space that we will work in, and typically it will be h1 that we will that we will need. So the minimization problem um, has a unique solution in a space W if it's a closed subspace of a Hilbert space H. The bilinear form satisfies two uh, properties. One, it is coercive, so bounded below in this way, and it is continuous or bounded above in this way, and the linear function is continuous. The two example problems that I've shown you for the Poisson equation, the heat equation, and the elasticity elasticity equation, both have unique solutions. Um, for the Poisson equation, we need something called the poincare friedrichs inequality yeah. to obtain this coerciveness in, um, inequality. Or and for elasticity, we need, uh, we'll need Korn's inequality to obtain that bound. So, right, that's the problem. Now let me go on to the whole business of um, spatially discrete approximation. So let's suppose we can't, and it's true that in general, we can't find 
an exact solution. The problem might be posed on a very complicated domain, like the one that I've shown you down below here. And what we want to do now is to pose the problem on a finite dimensional subspace with the property that uh, it's parameterized by uh, a quantity h, which we'll call the mesh size, with the property that as this goes to zero, I will approach my exact solution in the sense over here. The way we do this with the finite element method is we partition the domain into subdomains of finite elements. So here's a, an example where this has been partitioned into tetrahedra. In two dimensions, it might, we might use triangles or squares or quadrilaterals. And then we uh, construct a basis that comprises continuous functions that are polynomials on each of these uh, subdomains or elements. And I'll show you a picture. So, so here I've taken this domain, subdivided into triangles in two dimensions, and I have a piecewise continuous polynomial approximation. Um, because I have a finite dimensional basis, I can write it out in terms of certain basis functions and use my weak formulation now to convert the problem to one of solving a system of simultaneous um, equations uh, where the matrix K will be, for the examples I've shown, it'll be symmetric and it'll be positive definite and it will have a unique solution. Um, uh, it will have a unique solution. And um, then the problem would be to find the um, conditions under which it converges. So um, the, 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 the theory, the mathematical theory of uh, finite elements um, is, based, oops, is based on um, what is called the mesh size. So the parameter H is the mesh size and it's really the largest of all the lengths across all of these subdomains. So that is something we can track um, as a means of uh, determining convergence. So when we talk about convergence, this is really what we're asking, under what conditions will this happen? We have, we have a, a condition, uh, or rather a lemma called Sayers' lemma, which bounds this error above in the H1 norm by the infimum over the distance from the exact solution to um, members of that space VH. This is very nice because I can take a special value of uh, a special member of VH and I'll take the interpolate to get the exact solution. Uh, so by the interpolate, I mean, if the green curve is my exact solution, this would be its interpolate in my finite dimensional space. And there's a very nice theory. It's quite old now. It's classical going back to Sial and Ravia, 1972, which gives us an interpolation estimate, right? So the difference between um, the function and its interpolate in any, um, well, in the L2 or the H1 norm, can be bounded above in this way. So as a result, we can, we can take, if I just go back here, I can say, well, this here will be bounded above by that interpolation error. And so we find that um, for the lowest order case, we have this dependence here. So the error depends linearly on the mesh size. So it depends linearly on, um, on if you like, the size the greatest length of any element, which intuitively is a fairly um, obvious thing. So that's all very basic. Um, but when we come to now what is a problem of more recent interest, uh, where you have this elasticity problem, but now one of the one of the parameters, lambda in particular, can become very large. Uh, physically, it's when the material uh, becomes incompressible. It's not able to undergo volumetric change, lambda goes to infinity. If I use the method that I've just shown you, just as it is, um, I will not get convergence. So here's a, a graph of the error, the log of the error against the log of h. I need to have a curve that looks like this, but in fact, I have something that looks like that. There. It does not converge. And the reason is, you know, I have this error estimate, but the constant depends on lambda, this quantity here, which gets very large. It depends on it in a bad way. And so I have a problem. I do not have convergence. I want to show you one uh, method for addressing that. It's called the discontinuous Galerkin method. 
Um, in this case over here, it's exactly its finite elements, the finite element method, but now I, I relax the condition of continuity across an element. I'm showing it here in one space dimension. Here's the jump between, uh, you know, across this boundary and I also need the average of whatever the quantity is. So more or less everything the same, but now I relax and, and now my, oops, my, my subspace is no, no longer, my subset is no longer a subspace of V. So I have to make various changes. I work with the different norm that involves the jumps. Um, as I said, I use the jump and I need the average as well. And this uh, variational formulation, which before had this term here and that term there only, now has additional terms, what is shaded here, involving jumps and averages of quantities. I won't go into the details, but, but um, one can develop this particular formulation when we relax continuity. So let me try one example. Here's a, an example. It's got an exact solution, which looks like that, but I don't have convergence. You see, once again, I still have what we call locking. There is no convergence. I still have a problem. What do we do about that? Well, first of all, we can, I can see, I can sort of see why I have a problem because if I develop the error estimate for this problem, the right hand side looks like this. My H is there, that's nice. But here I have terms involving U and the solution and lambda squared. Now, the, this term and this term, they are okay because we have an a priori estimate, U to Brenner and Sum which tells us that this quantity is bounded above uniformly. <clears throat> That's nice, but I've got this quantity in the middle and so I can't bound the term and it's still lambda dependent, I still have a problem. Um, this is the same formulation that I showed you uh, two slides ago. What I have to do is I, I have to modify this now. So I modify it by replacing these quantities here by their projections onto constants in a numerical sense, in a computational sense, what it means is that we, we reduce the order of quadrature, but mathematically we replace everything here by its projection onto constants. And then what we do, what happens is that we do get the desired uniform error bound that I can bound independent of lambda. And if I now run the same example as before for the modified formulation, and even if I use just a P1 approximation on the element, I get this convergence here, which is at the predicted uh, linear rate. Okay. Um, so uh, that is just a, a glimpse of the, uh, of the discontinuous Galerkin ap approach um, where one can, in a sense, relax. So if I just go back here, just to um, show you what, what I had, that is what I have. Um, CG means the conforming, the conventional classical approach, which we knew, know doesn't work. Um, this discontinuous Galerkin approach also does not work unless I, <coughs> oops, unless I introduce this projection over here, which uh, in a sense relaxes it. And I can show in, in the DG norm uh, that I have this, um, I have this um, error estimate here. So what this means, if I could just go back to show you again, the DG norm, it tells me about convergence, not only uh, with respect to L2 on each of these subdomains, but it also tells me about convergence um, of the jump across the elements. So that goes to zero and I recover also the, in the limit, the continuous solution to my problem. Um, so um, there are many, many other examples that I, that I could show and there are other approaches to this, but what I've tried to do here is to give you, as I, as I was saying earlier, just a flavor of the kind of, kind of work that we're involved in, where I should say that much of our work uh, um, is in collaboration between mathematicians, numerical analysts, and people who work in computational sciences and engineering. Um, so there are just two references here that I've um, indicated. Uh, 
They are both with a former student of mine, Beverly Greesaver, and a former postdoc, Andrew McBride. There's some earlier work where, where we actually carried out the analysis that I've shown you. Um, and more recently, we, um, we extended this work um, to um, aspects that I've not talked about, but where we have looked at general quadrilateral and general hexahedral elements. In other words, where we deviate from these very nice shapes and one has to take that into account in uh, carrying out the analysis. So, so Chair, with that, I would like to conclude here uh, by thanking well, the University of Cape Town, uh, the National Research Foundation for funding, and also the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation from whom, from which I have received a research award, um, and during which time this, some of this work was uh, carried out. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daya, for your talk. Is Professor Victoria Gould ready? You can start, you can start if you are ready. Yeah, I heard you, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and apologies yeah. uh, for the slight, slight delay there. Um, well, let me say it's a, it's a real honor to be invited to take part in this interdisciplinary meeting and I'm enjoying it very much. Thank you. I really admire the organizers for getting um, mathematicians, algebraists and social scientists and indeed applied mathematicians together to talk to one another. Uh, this, can, this can only be fruitful. Okay, so here's a brief overview of my talk. Uh, what do I mean by topical matrices? They sound so nice and uh, warm and sunny. Uh, but what are they? Um, why are these good things? What do I mean by idempotence? And then what do I mean by idempotence in tropical matrices? And why might these be a good and interesting thing? And the ballpark that we're in here is the um, behavior and influence of idempotence in algebra, um, particularly in uh, semigroup theory. And thank you to my colleagues yesterday for introducing algebraic structures and uh, semigroups. And I'm definitely coming at this from the point of view of a semigroup theorist. And a little bit of new work in the talk that I will mention at the end comes from a recent joint paper with uh, Marianne Johnson of the University of Manchester and Manasa Naz of Fatima Jinnah Women's University. All right, well, um, I'm certainly not from the tropics. I live and work in the uh, ancient city of York in the north of the UK, on the north of England, perhaps the middle of the UK. Uh, here is what is in my unbiased opinion, uh, one of the finest medieval cathedrals um, in Northern Europe. Uh, now, York was founded by, by the Romans who are here a millennia before this uh, minster, our cathedral was built. And if you look carefully in this picture, you can see a statue here. And this is of the Roman Emperor Constantine, who, who was the first Christian Roman Emperor and who was crowned Emperor in York. And here is a really nice connection with our virtual hosts because Constantine here was born in Niche. Uh, York lies in the ancient region of Yorkshire um, and over the last year when we've pretty much only been able to enjoy outside activities we felt very lucky to live in a place with so much beautiful scenery and fresh air. Okay so um, tropical mathematics, uh, so tropical matrices are a part of tropical mathematics, what on earth is tropical mathematics? Well, it's algebra, analysis, geometry, combinatorics, other aspects of mathematics related to the tropical semi-ring. And again, yesterday, luckily, um, Misha defined uh, semi-rings for you. A more prosaic name is the max plus uh, semi-ring, so max plus mathematics, and you'll see why it gets that name in a moment. And don't worry, I'm going to give you the definitions very shortly. 
Tropical mathematics lies in the area of what's known as idempotent analysis. And uh, uh, again, I'll define exactly idempotence shortly, but the idea of an idempotent operation is as follows. It's something that when you do it once, it doesn't matter if you repeat it, nothing new happens. So if I give you a bit of information, right, you know that information, you've got it. If I then repeat it again, it doesn't make any difference, right? You got it the first time and, and so on. Uh, if you're familiar with a little bit of linear algebra, then here is a more mathematical um, example of an idempotent, the projection in R2 of a point x, y onto the, the y-axis. So if you do that once, you take x, y to zero, y, you do it again, you stay at zero, y. This is an example of an idempotent operation, and you will see a lot more shortly. Tropical mathematics itself has got roots in many places in the last century. Uh, a coherent theory only began to develop uh, in the last 30 years. The Appalachian tropical is generally thought to be in honor of Imre Simon, who spent many years of his life working in the tropical region of Brazil. For pure mathematicians, um, tropical mathematics in particular, tropical geometry is interesting um, because uh, it provides a way of, if you'll excuse the language, combinatorializing questions of algebraic geometry. For applied mathematicians and uh, social scientists and people who might want to use this stuff, it has many uses. It can be used to model networking and scheduling processes, a whole list of applications, including to, to subjects as far away as as, e as economics. All right, well, I again, I'm lucky in that Misha explained um, law and semi-groups and algebra in general yesterday, uh, but in case people missed that, I'm going to give you a crash course in semi-group theory and a semi-group law or axiom. So probably most people here will know what semi-groups are, but just in case, I think it's worthwhile to discuss this. So in fact, everybody, whether they realize it or not, is familiar with semi-group theory because we're all familiar with adding numbers. So I take a pair of numbers, A, B, and I kick out another number, A plus B. So that's a way of adding two things together. It's a binary operation. If we've got three things to add together, then, well, we're lucky because we need to put brackets in to tell ourselves which order to do the operations, but it doesn't matter where we put the brackets. And this is known as the associative law. Similarly, for multiplying numbers, uh, if I take the pair AB and I kick out the number A times B, which I usually write just as A juxtaposed with B in this way, again, it doesn't matter where I put the brackets when I need to multiply three or more things together. Yes, um, we're familiar with composing operations and functions are also operations, so this applies to functions. So when I write A circle B, I'm going to mean you do A and then you do B. If I've got three operations to compose, again, it doesn't matter where I put the brackets because on each side of the equality when I unravel things, the instruction is I do A and then I do B and then I do C. Now, perhaps I should say that the first two examples are a wee bit different to the third one in that it doesn't matter whether I do A plus B or B plus A. Addition is commutative. AB is the same as BA for multiplying in the usual sense. Multiplication is commutative. Composing operations is not. Right, because doing A and then doing B is not the same thing as the other way around. So if the A is putting on your socks and B is putting on your shoes, doing A and then doing B is a okay operation. If you do it the other way around, you're going to get into some difficulties. Now, all a semi-group is, is a, a set S. So this is the collection of things I'm going to operate upon together with an operation that I think of as an abstract multiplication that takes a pair AB and I write it just as little a little b. Um, and I think of this as the product of A and B such that the associative law holds. And this allows us to multiply more things together, to do things like taking powers 
all the usual algebraic operations one is used to. And really almost any kind of algebraic structure worth its salt is a semi-group. And my tropical semi-ring is going to be a semi-group in two interrelated ways. Okay, so I better tell you what it is. Well, the underlying set is the real number. So all, all numbers, including weird things like pi and root two and so on, together with an extra symbol that I write as minus infinity because it's going to behave like you would like minus infinity to behave in algebraic operations. I then have my two operations. The first one is kind of okay. I'm going to write it as plus with a circle round because it is not going to be like usual plus. And what it is is the maximum of A and B. And here, remember that minus infinity is going to be less than anything. So the maximum of minus infinity and anything will be the anything. So far, so good. Where it gets a bit strange is that multiplication that I write with a circle round to distinguish it from ordinary multiplication is actually ordinary addition. So A tropical times B is the sum of A and B. And we know perfectly well how this works for real numbers. In fact, I've got a group there, but then I've got the extra element minus infinity and minus infinity plus anything is just minus infinity. Okay, if I throw away minus infinity, what's left I denote by T star. So let's do a little sum here. Two times minus infinity plus minus two times five. Well, I just need to unwind this in the order so that the brackets tell me. So the times operation is plus there. So that's what's going on first. Two plus minus infinity is minus infinity. Minus two plus five is still three, thank goodness. And then minus infinity plus three is the, or tropical plus three is the maximum of minus infinity in three, and three is clearly bigger than minus infinity. All right, this does take a little bit of getting used to, um, but this kind of um, sum, this kind of calculation, just gives you a tiny inkling of how, for example, um, the tropical semi-ring can be used in problems connected with say scheduling, because suppose I've got a bunch of processes to do and I want to work out the maximum time it's going to take. Well, some of these processes can be done in, in parallel and some in sequence. For those that need to be done sequentially, the time that that run of things take will be the sum of the times. And then the total time required will be the maximum of the sum of the times that the sequential processes take. And that's exactly what expressions of this kind are, are um, capturing. All right, now my tropical semi-ring is special in that if I add A to A, I just get A again because the maximum of A and A is just A. In other words, every A is idempotent. And there's a bunch of axioms that I'm not going to give you, but exactly the axioms for a semi-ring and indeed uh, such that T satisfies those. And because I have the, the group of real numbers under addition underlying the multiplicative structure, T gets a special name. It's an idempotent semi-field. All right, well, what about matrices? Well, if you know a bit about ordinary matrices, then all will be well, because tropical matrices behave in the same way. So if N is a fixed natural number, uh, the tropical matrices in MNT consists of N by N arrays of elements of T. So that's the underlying set. And then I can put two operations on this set, addition, and I'm not gonna talk about this today, and multiplication, and I'll briefly give you an example in a moment. Um, and MNT has also it, all sorts of uses in applications to algebraists, it's got an immediate formal purpose as the monoid of structure preserving maps, not just of T, but of entuples of elements of T. It works in more or less the same way as MNR for the reals would work for um, entuples of real numbers. Right, so I better give you an example of multiplying tropical matrices. Now here are two 
A and B, and these are actually quite special ones. But anyway, I'm going to use these two for my calculation. How do I multiply two matrices? Well, in the same way as I multiply ordinary matrices. So the ij entry of A times B is going to be the i throw of A, if you like, dot product with the jth column of B. Um, right, now you're not, you don't have time to figure all of this out, but let's just take one entry here. So the entry in the first row of AB in the second column, I get this uh, by multiplying the first row of uh, A with the first column of B. So I get zero times B plus A times zero. And when you do the math that comes out as I have here, so this would be A tropical plus B. Now these matrices are special and I chose them for a reason. They're upper triangular in that they've got minus infinity, which acts as a multiplicative zero below the leading diagonal. And actually I've got zeros on the leading diagonal. And um, what else did I want to say? Okay, if A is actually equal to B, little a equal to little b, this is just going to be A, and then capital A is equal to capital B, and my matrix capital A is also an idempotent. That's quite particular to the two by two case, I should say. All right, well, how would I understand the algebraic properties of tropical matrices? Well, I have myself any multiplicative structure, and perhaps the first thing I want to look at is uh, what matrices are invertible? Um, well, by invertible, I mean for A, there's an A minus one, such that when I multiply them together, I get the identity matrix. This doesn't get me very far because the only invertible elements, the only invertible matrices, are those with exactly one non zero element in every row and column. All right, so I'll put that to one side. Um, if A isn't invertible, is A regular, which is, if you like, the next best thing. So is there a B such that A is equal to A, B, A? Okay, sometimes this is called von Neumann regular. Well, um, we're not in luck because it follows from an old, a relatively old result of Illin that um, MNT does not consist entirely of regular elements. And then I want to show you the next result, although it's not actually part of the, of the real flow of this talk, um, but it's so nice, I wanted to mention it. And this is, it's actually this result announced at a meeting in 2013, I think, that got me interested in tropical matrices. So this is a result of Izakian, Marianne Johnson, and uh, Mark Cambetes, um, that actually pins down which matrices are regular. So what I haven't told you is that tropical matrices come along with algebraic properties, but also topological ones. And these algebraic and, top and topological properties give you notions of rank, which tend to be different. And this beautiful result of IJK, as I refer to those three, um, says that a matrix is regular precisely when those notions of rank coincide. So I think this is a, a, a lovely thing. Okay, but basically not all matrices in MNT are regular, so what are we going to do? Well, I'm going to switch for a moment to looking at idempotents. So an element A in a semigroup S is idempotent if it squares to itself, as I guess you've gathered by now. So we've seen lots of examples of idempotents. Um, I don't think I've mentioned these rather trivial ones, in the real numbers, zero plus zero is zero, zero times zero is zero, one times one is one, if you know a bit of group theory, the identity is the only idempotent. And as I've just said, I've shown you several concrete examples of idempotents, including matrices of this form. So these are two by two matrices that are upper triangular with zeros down the leading diagonal. This is quite special to the two by two case. Now you might well say to me, I was talking about regularity and now I've switched to idempotents and idempotents in a title, well, why? Well, here is why. Because if A is regular, then I automatically get two idempotents. So if A is equal to ABA, then just doing the math on AB, squaring it, rearranging the brackets, and I know I can do that because I'm in associative world, 
I get that AB squared is AB. So AB is idempotent. So AB is a special idempotent left identity for A. And dually BA is a special idempotent right identity for A. So I'm going to say a couple of things about idempotence in tropical matrices. The first is what they might generate. And this is always a bit of a surprise to people when I talk about idempotent generation because idempotency in groups are very sparse. They, there's only one of them, they don't generate very much. But in general, idempotents generate a lot in semigroups, whatever that means. So a semigroup is idempotent generated if every element is a product of idempotents. And one reason why such semigroups are idempotent are important is because how we showed in 66 that every semigroup embeds in one that's generated by idempotents. So it sits inside one that's generated by idempotents and you can put the word finite in there. And you might like to just pause and do a double take because this also applies to groups. Every group sits inside a semigroup that's idempotent generated. It's really kind of cool. So this and other authors work has led to many directions of study of idempotence and looking at idempotence is kind of inherent to um, semigroup theory over the last decades, including current semigroup theory. And what's relevant to this talk is that many natural semigroups consist of two parts, the invertible elements that I showed you a couple of slides back, and then the rest, where the rest turns out to be elements that are products of idempotence. This applies, for example, to matrices over a field. All right, but I'm in tropical worlds, so I'll be continuing with that. Oh, I just wanted to finish this slide by saying, idempotents have their own innate structure, that of a biordered set. And this is also a nice way into studying idempotents in semigroups. And I'll mention that briefly again shortly. Okay. So one result on idempotent generation and perhaps one result on um, the other behavior of idempotence. So essentially when Marianne and Manasseh and I started on our, what turned out to be a bit of a mammoth project, we kept running into brick walls. Things didn't work out quite as we might have hoped. One's intuition is certainly challenged by tropical world. Um, but we did get quite a few results. And one that's easy to present to you here is one for the uh, semi-group of strictly upper triangular tropical matrices. And this is UTNT star, that's what we called it anyway. If I have zeros down the leading diagonal, then this gives me a smaller sub semi -group, and this is called UNT star. So let me give you an example. This A is in the bigger semigroup. It's strictly upper triangular. I've got zeros below or minus infinity below leading diagonal, non-zero elements above the on and above the leading diagonal. This B is similarly in UTNT star, but this B is better in that it's got the identity under multiplication down the leading diagonal. Uh, and sorry, folks, the identity here is zero. So it, as I say, it does take a bit of getting used to. All right, well, what are the idempotents in UTNT star? Well, it's just a little bit of calculation, which isn't really difficult. Well, it enables us to pin them down exactly. A matrix in UTNT star is idempotent precisely when it has zeros down the leading diagonal and all of these inequalities hold. Right, some of them can be equalities, some of them can be strict inequalities, but all of these inequalities need to hold. Well, I could say more about that, but that's not, that's, neither, it's, it's, that's not the time and perhaps it's not the place. Okay, so there's a consequence of this. If C is idempotent and D is idempotent, then I have to have zeros down the leading diagonal, which means each of them is actually in UNT star. And as UNT star is a sub semigroup, the product is in the sub semigroup. So if I've got a bunch of idempotents in UTNT star and I multiply them together, I'm only ever going to stay in the smaller sub semigroup. But what we were able to do is to show 
that I get everything in the smaller sub semi group as a product of idempotence. So this required a little bit of algebraic jiggery pokery, let me say. All right, just one more result and I'll, I'll wrap up, or just one more idea perhaps, and one more result and I'll wrap up. So as I say, we struggled a bit to get results for MNT star, though we, we, we have got some. Um, but when we came to UTNT star, suddenly things seemed to drop nicely into our hands. So this is one example. You see in the description of idempotence on the previous slide involving well, the slide before last thing involving inequalities. Suppose we do the following. I take myself a tropical upper triangular matrix A and I make myself a new one that I'm going to call A plus. To get A plus, I've got to say, what are the entries of A plus? And I say that the IJ entry of A plus is going to be the minimum of these differences. So it's like, if you like, inspired by the definition of an idempotent. Then something really nice turns uh, happens. This A plus turns out to be idempotent and is a special left identity for A. I'll briefly say what I mean by special. So um, one nice way of saying it is that this semi-group is fountain. And what this means is that every element has got a left idempotent identity that's minimum in a particular sense. Um, one way of saying it is that each R tilde class contains an idempotent and dually each L tilde class contains an idempotent. So A plus A is A and A plus is a special left identity for A and dually for A star. Okay, so such semi-groups used to be called weakly abundant, but a couple of years ago, given that so many semi-groups have this property, um, Margolis and Steinberg renamed them Fountain after John Fountain, a colleague of mine in York. But what's really surprising here is that I've got a unique item potent in the class of this relation, whatever it is, and in the class of this relation, whatever it is. Now, if this was in regular world and I had unique item potents in these classes, um, one exercise we would give our, um, our master's students is show then that idempotents commute, right? It's not easy, but it's true. Idempotents don't commute here. The by ordered set of idempotents of UTNT star is really, it's really beautiful, but sort of surprising. Anyway, enough, enough, enough of this, I should wrap up. So some final comments then. Um, idempotents have got unexpected, curious, um, but very, for at least UTNT start in the end pleasing behavior. Something I've just touched on is there's a deep relationship between algebraic and topological properties of matrices. And given that every matrix is somehow related to an idempotent, I've demonstrated this to, for UTNT star, but it's also true for MNT. This relationship isn't just for idempotents, it's for all matrices. And, um, this I'm sure will be a topic of further study. Practical point of view, given that everything in UTNT star, apart from the invertible ones, products of idempotence, can this be used in applications? And finally, some of our results work not just for the tropical semi-ring, but for other kinds of semi-rings, we would like to potentially extend this further. So it only remains for me to thank, uh, the organizers and particular Melania for wanting to include me in this uh, very nice meeting. Thank you. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Groups. So now let's have a small break. We will start again at 11. Introduce uh, Bertrand Juve, who's going to give this talk on complex networks mining by vertex elimination scheme. Over to you, Bertrand. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yeah, it's okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you to the organizers to invite me. And um, so I will um, present you some work uh, we have made with uh, Etienne Fieu, a colleague in Toulouse. It's uh, a work at the uh, frontier between uh, graph theory and topology. So, yes. Okay. Um, 
there is a motivation for this work. The motivation is that uh, we are in a world uh, completely uh, embedded in, a, in, a, in networks. And uh, uh, it's uh, very often difficult to uh, explore networks and the, the global uh, form of the networks. So um, one uh, solution is to uh, um, understand how local interactions shape the network at the global level. And um, so I will present you how we can uh, have a mathematical approach of this uh, issue, uh, how local uh, constraints on the network can influence the global level. So uh, briefly, uh, we put some mathematical constraints on the new nodes on the network, and we will uh, investigate how these uh, constraints uh, influence the mathematical property of the network at the global level. Well, uh, okay. So some uh, notations and definitions. J, uh, G, we did not uh, find it in derivative graph without loop. And uh, N is uh, the number of vertices and M the number of edges. We will use very often the open neighborhood of the vertex. The open neighborhood is just the vertices that are neighbors uh, to I. It's uh, open neighbors for I. And uh, we don't have loops. So uh, I is not uh, a neighbor of uh, itself. But we can uh, consider the closed neighborhood where we add I to uh, its open neighborhood, and it's the closed neighborhood. Um, we will also uh, consider the induced subgraph of uh, J induced by vertices one, two, etc. to I. And uh, we will consider uh, the, the, the concept of vertex elimination scheme. Given a property B, uh, a graph J as a, a vertex dimension scheme for P, if there exists a linear ordering of the vertices one to N, such that the open neighborhood of G uh, minus that is one to I minus one as property P. This is, if you want to understand this property, is equivalent to, to constraint G from an isolated vertex by successively adding vertices two, three, et cetera, to n, such that the neighborhood of the vertex you had has property P. So you attach uh, the new vertex to a, 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 a number of vertices in such a way that the angus uh, graph, uh, the neighborhood angus graph has property P. An example. Uh, just have a look at the chordal graph. The chordal graph is a graph which uh, doesn't contain uh, induced cycle of lengths greater than four. Here, for example, this is not chordal graph because you have a cycle of lengths four, and so this is a chordal graph. And um, if you take as uh, the property P, the property to be simplicial. So a vertex I is simplicial if its neighborhood is complete, that is uh, the neighborhood, the, the graph neighborhood has all the possible links. And you say that graph G is simplicial if there is a linear ordering of its vertices with property P to be simplicial. That is, uh, you can add that this is one successively one after one in such a way that the neighborhood of the, the vertex you had uh, is uh, complete. So for instance, here, you have an isolated vertex, vertex. You add this vertex because its neighborhood 
this uh, isolated vertex is complete. And you can add this vertex here because uh, open neighborhood is this graph, which is complete. And you can add here this vertex because the neighborhood here is uh, this graph, which is complete also. Okay. And there is a, a very beautiful theorem proved by Dirac in uh, 1961. The finite graph is cordial, if and only if it is simplicial. That is, if and only if there is a complete, a simplicial elimination scale or a complete elimination scale. Okay. Um, we are interested in a uh, generalization of this property to be cordial for the following reason. In, uh, about social networks, uh, Ronald Burt, sociologist, uh, published a book called The uh, Structure of Alls, The Social Structure of Competition, and briefly said that uh, it's very important for people to um, take the, the, the holes in a network to increase their influence. And uh, if you want to uh, uh, analyze big networks, social networks, you may have a look at what happened specifically around holes in the network. And uh, as you have seen, uh, the uh, notion of caudal is linked to the cycles. So when my colleague, we uh, generalize we have generalized the caudal property uh, to, to modelize such a way, modelize uh, property about holes in networks. So oh, I will say, uh, I will give you uh, some more definitions. The vertex I is dominated or dismantable in G. If there is another vertex such that the, the closed neighborhood of I is included in the closed neighborhood, neighborhood J. So it's, uh, you can say, you can uh, look that uh, like uh, the, the closed neighborhood of I is a cone. And we will say that graph G is dismantable. There is a linear ordering of its vertices in such a way that uh, I is dismantable in G, in G minus one to I minus one. So the property P here is dominated by or dismantable. Um, so I gave you here an example, dismantable vertex. Uh, let's take this from here. So you have here a graph. You can dismantle this vertex because this neighborhood or close neighborhood if you want is dismantle. Uh, sorry. Yes, okay. And here you can dismantle this vertex because this neighborhood is dismantable. And this is, sorry, this is, uh, okay. this is the open neighborhood, not the closed neighborhood. And you can dismantle this vertex for this neighborhood, it's uh, dismantable, so it's uh, the isolated vertex. Okay, and uh, to be dismantable is a generalization of, of to be cordial. The cordial graph is dismantable. And to characterize uh, the dismantable graphs, we use a concept from algebraic topology. And in particular, we use the concept of homotopy. I will explain you how we do that. And this uh, 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 way to, to, to do, uh, is a solution to explore dismantable vertices and then holes in networks because dismantable vertices are generalization of cordial graphs 
and so it's linked to holes in networks. Uh, okay, we do the bridge between topology and uh, graph theory uh, with the simplicial complexes of clicks. So a simplicial complex, I think everyone here knows simplicial complex. And uh, so I remind you here the definition. And maybe I can run. So just uh, I, will, I will say here that uh, the simplicial complex K of a graph uh, is in fact the simplicial complex K of its click graph. That is the simplex of, the, of K are the click of the graphs. That is the complex subgraphs of the graph. This is a simplicial complex. Um, we um, ask you to look at uh, two operations, the elementary strong collapse. Uh, an elementary strong collapse in a, in a simplicial complex uh, K is the deletion of a vertex V whose link, so the link here uh, symbolize formalize in fact the open neighborhood in the case of simplicial complexes. Uh, so, so here the, the, the link is a cone. So you see immediately the, the, uh, the link with uh, the notion of a dismountable vertex. Because in the graph, a dismountable uh, vertex is dismountable if it's neighbor is a cone. Um, Okay, the second operation is the elementary simplicial collapse in K. It's the deletion of a pair of simplices, sigma and tau, where tau is a proper maximal phase of sigma. That is a, a phase of sigma, which is uh, the phase, which is not the phase of another simplice. Um, so, I go on, and there is a, a result of Pharma in million 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 2020, well, sorry. Uh, a strong collapse is a particular kind of simplicial collapse. This is very important. Uh, and Pharma um extend the notion of uh, collapsibility to zero collapsibility and n collapsibility in the following way. Uh, say that the zero collapsibility is a strong collapsibility. So remind that uh, 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 a simplicial collapse is a uh, strong collapsible. Strong collapsible. If you can go from K to the point by uh, successive uh, deletion of vertex V whose uh, link is a code. And uh, K is n collapsible. It exists a sequence of n collapses such that K go to the point with a successive n collapsible. And to say that uh, um, uh, and an n collapsible, an collapsible operation is uh, such that the uh, 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 vertex is n collapsible if its neighborhood, if its link, you want, think, is n minus one collapsible. Okay. So, and you have the proposition, of course, that k is strong uh, collapsible. Uh, if uh, imply that k is one collapsible imply that uh, k is n collapsible to the point. Okay, in practice, when you implement these operations on uh, simplicial complexes, the presence of cycles of length four are very particular and appears as barrier to the dismantable process. Very often, you cannot go to the point and you are blocked, you are trapped in, uh, in, uh, in uh, configurations where cycles of length four uh, uh, block you. Okay. 
uh, with Etienne, we tried to uh, translate these sort of implications uh, for graphs. Um, so, as I said to you, the click complex delta of G uh, of the graph is the simplicial complex such that the templates are the clicks of G, that is, the complete subgraphs of G. I represent here some examples that I think you have understood. So I go on. And here is the definition. This is very similar uh, as that of Barmack and Minion for simplicial complexes in a graph. A vertex i still zero dismantable if it is dismantable, that is if it is dominated. A vertex i is was dismantable if it's open neighborhood is dismantable, that is zero dismantable. And a vertex i is k dismantable if it's open neighborhood is k minus one dismantable, that is exactly the same ID of Dharma Canadian of synthesis and we have uh, these uh, equivalents g g is to zero dismantable if and only if its click complex is zero collapsible and g is k dismantable if and only if its click complex is k collapsible um, so it's possible to go from the graph to a simple cell complex and return uh, and it's uh, true also for the K dismantable operation. Here is a, an example. Uh, the neighborhood of this red vertex is the path of length three. This is dismantable, one dismantable, for instance. So you can delete in. The same for this one. The neighborhood of this vertex is the H. This is dismantable, so you can delete the vertex, and then, and you arrive on the cycle of lens four, and there is no more one dismantable, and no more k dismantable vertex that is in the cycle of lens four. Okay, uh, yes, okay. I go on. Uh, just look at this, the remark two, this is very important. The order of K dismantability is important for K uh, greater than one. For K equal to zero, it's not important. When you have the choice to dismantable one vertex or another, not important. At the end, the, the graph is the same. When K is uh, greater than one, it's not the same. Here is an example. In this graph, the neighborhood of this vertex is a path of length three. So you can delete the vertex and you are in the C5. The C5 is that there is no uh, dismantable vertex, no K dismantable vertex in the C5. But you can also dismantable this vertex, which neighborhood is a path of length two. So it's dismantable. And you are here. And then you can dismantle this vertex and you arrive on the C4. And C4 and C5 are not the same graph, and you can not go from one to the other by a, a K dismantable operation. Okay. Um, if, if we did not ID and XK the state of K. K dismantable graphs, uh, you have these inclusions, and this sequence is strictly increasing. That is, we exhibit here uh, some graphs, or little complicated graphs, we call the cubion, n cubion, in such a way that the n cubion is uh, in D index n minus one, I think but not in D index N minus two. Yes, 
that. Okay. Uh, so we have some results. Maybe I can go on because not a lot of time. And okay, uh, because we're interested in uh, holes in networks, we are maybe we want to say that in a network, the C5 is in the same class as the C4, because we just want to know how different holes in the complex network are organized. But maybe it's not important to, to, to say that uh, there is uh, five or six or seven edges on the, on the board here. So we introduced the notion of uh, Kaomotopic and what is uh, to, to, what are two graphs uh, Kaomotopic? Two graphs, G and G prime are Kaomotopic. If it's possible to go from J to G prime by succession of addition or deletion of countable vertices. For instance here, we can go from the C5 to the C4 by adding a vertex, which is chi dismantable, because enabled is chi dismantable, which is a pass of length three. And then you delete the red vertex and this one, you arrive on the C4. So uh, we have two reasons. The first one is that it's not the same thing uh, to do zero dismontable and zero addition of vertices into the one dismontable and one addition of vertices. But uh, when you are after k equal to one, or k equal to two, three, et cetera, this is exactly the same thing, the same classes to do one dismontable, one homotopic and k homotopic operations. And uh, if you look at uh, so the one classes, one homotopic classes of graphs or k homotopic classes, the same thing. There is an equivalence between looking at k homotopic class, classes of uh, the graph and the simplicial homotopy classes of the simplicial complexes of the click, the click simplicial complexes. Okay, and the last thing uh, is that this uh, uh, property to be one dismontable or zero dismontable is very, very sensitive. And if you take two famous examples of the Densat and the Biggs house, if you take the, the for instance, the Densat, the, the one skeleton of the triangulation of the Densat, you can add the, the one triangulation of uh, the one skeleton of the triangulations of the Densat is not k dismontable for any k. But if you had a, a vertex, uh, if you zero add a vertex, you obtain a graph which is one dismontable. And adding a, a, a zero adding a vertex, it's, a, it's a very simple. Okay, it's the same thing for the Bing's house. Um, oh, good, uh, a, a, a nice graphic, uh, nice draw, okay. So the conclusion to, to stand the time. Um, so we, also, also we are often responsible for the complexity of large and dynamic networks. Uh, we don't fully understand or control its effect. It's what I said at the beginning. And uh, a way to, to control the, the, the way a, a network uh, develop or uh, evaluate is to keep the control of, of some networks. It's to understand how local uh, impact in the network influence the, the global level. And here, when we introduce with HN these operations of k dismantability and uh, k additions. It's a way to understand how new vertices that added, that uh, has been added to the network, influence, impact the world topology of the network. Um, 
just a mathematical question to finish. Uh, we have seen with the Densat and the Bing's house uh, how it's possible to add zero vertex, to zero add uh, a vertex to begin one dismontable. And the question is if G is a graph such as uh, is peak complex, delta of G is contractible. Is it exist always a graph W with uh, G? go to the value with a zero add and go down to the point with a one dismontable uh, successive that is this is uh, a question phenomenon thank you thank you very much Bertrand for that very interesting talk um, that was fascinating and uh, we should move on quickly to our second talk in this session which is by Vladimir Batigi, uh, and he's going to talk about semi-rings in network data analysis and overview. Flado, over to you. So uh, I would like to uh, present today an overview of um, uh, different semi-rings that are uh, used in uh, network data analysis. Um, so I became interested in uh, networks and semi-rings uh, uh, already as an undergraduate student in the uh, 70s. At that time, I studied in Nancy in France, and uh, he provided me with a copy of lectures uh, uh, of Claude Per on networks. And at the same time, uh, we studied uh, a switching theory. Uh, um, so uh, uh, I um, generalized so-called uh, Lund's uh, theorem from uh, switching matrices to uh, matrices uh, over absorptive semi-rings. Uh, I also submitted this uh, uh, result to uh, uh, IFIP uh, conference that was, was uh, in uh, 71 in Ljubljana, but I was not successful at that time. So this was my uh, uh, first uh, in encounter with uh, uh, Semerix. Now, uh, <clears throat> a general story uh, when, we are try when we are trying to um, apply uh, 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 so when we, we are trying to, to uh, compute with weights in networks, it turns out that there are two uh, basic situations. One is uh, the situation of parallel uh, walks or uh, links. And now if I have, uh, have a weight A uh, and B on two uh, arcs, uh, the question is how to combine these two weights, uh, uh, two weights into uh, a weight of a single arc uh, uh, linking U and V. And uh, assume that uh, uh, this composition uh, is uh, denoted by plus. So we have plus uh, corresponds to uh, combining uh, parallel uh, weights. And the other situation is uh, when we have two consecutive uh, uh, arcs, uh, the first arc uh, uh, joining U to T and uh, the, the other arc joining T to V and uh, with weights A and B. Now, if I would like to uh, replace this value with, uh, with a value on a single arc joining U to V, uh, we apply here uh, a multiplication. Now, the meaning uh, uh, of uh, addition and multiplication depends on on particular problem. And uh, now, if we if we ask ourselves what are uh, the uh, the rules that uh, these uh, two operations should obey, it turns out that uh, a semi ring is just the right uh, structure for uh, um, dealing with uh, weights uh, on uh, networks. And uh, to extend the, uh, the notion of the weight from arcs 
two uh, sets of uh, walks uh, on, uh, on the network. Other people already uh, introduced the, the notion of semi-ring, so uh, I uh, suppose that uh, uh, this definition is uh, uh, already known. So we, are, we say that uh, a, a set A with two operations, uh, addition and multiplication, and uh, neutral elements zero and one is a semi-ring. If uh, uh, for the first operation it's a Belian monoid, for the second operation is uh, uh, just a monoid and multiplication distributes over uh, addition. In, not, uh, in my notation, I, I'm always assuming that uh, uh, multiplication uh, uh, has uh, precedence over uh, the addition. Now, uh, when we are dealing with, uh, with walks uh, uh, on a network, uh, it, we can, uh, uh, we can uh, get uh, uh, sets, uh, infinite sets of uh, walks. So we have to uh, account for this. And so we introduce the notion of complete semi-ring. And we say that uh, the semi-ring is, uh, is, a, is a complete semi-ring if uh, addition is well defined also for countable uh, sets of elements. And uh, commutativity, associativity and distributivity uh, hold in, uh, 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 in also in this case. Uh, idempotency was already introduced, so uh, the addition is idempotent if uh, uh, A plus A equals A. What's uh, uh, important? is that uh, if we have an idempotent uh, uh, semi-ring or a finite set, then this semi-ring is uh, uh, complete. Uh, often it turns out that uh, an additional operation can be introduced in a semi-ring. Uh, this is called a closure operation. And uh, we usually require that for closure uh, operation, uh, these uh, equalities hold. So A star equals one plus A times A star. And this is the same as uh, one plus A star times A. Uh, what's interesting is that in, uh, in general, in the same semi ring, different closures can exist. But, uh, in a complete semi-ring, the closure that is defined as, uh, 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 let us say, sum of uh, geometrical uh, sequence uh, 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 is uh, all closure. Introduce uh, a quite uh, uh, quite uh, uh, um, important is absorption. Absorption uh, says that uh, uh, A times B plus uh, A uh, times C times B equals uh, A times B. So uh, you see this, uh, if I have here uh, a term that uh, contains something more than uh, just A and B, this is absorbed uh, inside uh, A and B. And uh, because of, uh, of distributivity, it turns out that uh, uh, for checking the absor uh, absorption, we just have to check this property that one plus C equals one. Now, uh, a lot uh, of things could be uh, uh, said about, uh, about semi-rings and so on, uh, but uh, uh, I have uh, just limited uh, uh, time. So uh, we wrote in uh, 
and Encyclopedia of Data Mining and uh, uh, Network an Analysis, an article about the uh, uh, relation of semi-rings, uh, uh, matrices, uh, uh, networks and corresponding matrices. So I will not go into, into uh, uh, these details, although the results are quite, uh, quite interesting. Then there are also uh, several books dealing, uh, dealing with uh, semi-rings in general. The most known are uh, Gondran and uh, uh, Minou, then Glazek, and recently Ostoich uh, also uh, published quite an interesting book uh, on applications of semi-rings and other uh, algebraic structures to uh, networks. Um, now, let's look to some examples of uh, uh, semi-rings that were uh, uh, used in uh, network data analysis. So I'm restricting my attention to uh, net, not network analysis in general, but uh, more to data an analytic uh, uh, tasks. So the first semi-ring uh, is uh, just the, uh, it's called combinatorial. And we have uh, uh, natural numbers and uh, usual addition and multiplication. Uh, in this case, uh, why we, uh, this semi-ring is called combinatorial? Because it, uh, it is actually uh, the scheme I mentioned before corresponds essentially to basic principles of combinatorics. So if I have uh, A, uh, if I can go from U to V, in A ways and uh, uh, also independently of this in B ways, then I can go uh, from U to V in A plus B ways. And if I can go from uh, U to T in A ways and from T to, uh, to V in B ways, then I can go from U to V in A times B ways. So this, these are just uh, uh, the basic principles of combinatorics uh, re rephrased uh, uh, in uh, terms of, of networks. <clears throat> then the other semi-ring is, uh, this can be ex also extended to uh, positive, non-negative real numbers. Then uh, the other semi-ring is reachability semi-ring. This is just uh, contains uh, uh, two values, zero and one. And then we have a logical uh, uh, or and uh, logical and. And uh, uh, if you look uh, uh, to the meaning, uh, uh, you interpret zero as uh, uh, the, the, the road is closed and uh, one is, uh, 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 the road is open. Now, if we have a parallel, uh, uh, link, uh, links then uh, arcs then uh, if uh, we can go past from U to V, uh, if uh, at least one of the roads is uh, is uh, open. And uh, but if I have sequential uh, links uh, arcs, then I can pass from U to V. Uh, uh, only in the case when both roads uh, are open, and this leads to uh, or and uh, uh, and. Then uh, for solving uh, shortest pet, uh, uh, pets problem, we have a semi-ring uh, with uh, non-negative no uh, real numbers. The, fir the uh, first operation is minimum and the second one is uh, addition. Then uh, we have so-called uh, max-min semi-ring, uh, which is uh, uh, dealing with uh, capacities, uh, uh, let us say load capacities of roads. Uh, this could be one of interpretation. Here we also have uh, non-negative real numbers and uh, 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 operations max and minimum. And uh, another one is uh, so-called pathfinder semi-ring. In Pathfinder semi-ring, we have uh, non-negative real numbers uh, e extended by infinity. And then we have two operation, the operations. The first one is minimum. 
and the other is uh, so-called Minkowski operation. Minkowski operation is defined in the in the following way. So A uh, combined uh, with B, uh, the value is computed so that we put uh, A to R and uh, B to R and we add this and then we uh, take the uh, art root uh, uh, of the obtained uh, sum. Uh, so in if R is one, we have just the usual addition. Uh, if R is two, we have some uh, something uh, similar to the, we could call this Pythagorean uh, operation. And if we have R infinity, uh, we get a maximum operation here. Uh, so this Pathfinder uh, uh, semi ring turns out to be quite useful when we are dealing with uh, uh, dense networks, uh, weighted networks. Here I have an example. So here uh, I have a network uh, uh, of, um, uh, of um, uh, a network of uh, international trade in uh, 99. Uh, and uh, if you look to this picture, we, 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 we don't see much. Essentially, we can see that uh, important countries are here in, uh, in, in, in this, around the center and peripheral countries are uh, uh, on, the, on the border. But uh, the picture is, is uh, how to say, is uh, unclear. So we don't see much, but uh, there is, uh, an, uh, an algorithm called uh, Pathfinder. Uh, this algorithm was developed by uh, psychologists uh, in the uh, 80s. And uh, uh, the idea is to remove uh, unimportant links from, uh, uh, from the picture so that we uh, get a kind of skeleton. Uh, in this case, a Pathfinder skeleton. And if we look to the uh, uh, corresponding Pathfinder uh, skeleton, in our case, we get this, this one. And <clears throat> so this is the, the same network, but uh, with uh, unimportant links uh, removed. So only the most important links are preserved. And what we, uh, we get here, we get uh, uh, some, uh, let us say, uh, central nodes like United States, uh, uh, France, uh, Germany, Japan, uh, Italy, uh, and uh, uh, Russian Federation here, and the rest of the countries that are uh, more or less attached to one or two of these uh, main nodes. So we, we get much more clear picture about, about the uh, international trade. Then uh, in so-called symbolic data analysis, uh, uh, one of the representation that is used uh, is uh, a representation of data by intervals. So uh, also interval and arithmetic is quite uh, interesting. And now if I have a network uh, uh, and to, if I attach uh, uh, such interval weights to, uh, to, to my arcs, then uh, it turns out that uh, uh, on uh, also for these intervals I can define a semi ring which is called interval semi ring and it is defined in, in this way. There is a recent uh, PhD uh, that was uh, that used this approach. Uh, uh, it was uh, made by Alves from Porto in Portugal. Now, uh, an, um, um, a bit more interesting semi-ring is uh, geodetic semi-ring. Geodetic semi-ring uh, is uh, defined on pairs of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, numbers. Essentially, uh, it is a combination of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, 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 
combinatorial semiring and uh, shortest path semiring. And uh, it is defined, uh, so the first uh, component is the length of the path, uh, and uh, the second component is the number of the, uh, of the uh, of paths between two uh, nodes. And uh, uh, this semiring was used to uh, uh, compute uh, uh, a matrix uh, needed uh, when you are trying to compute between this uh, in a network. So it's uh, a kind of not. So we get a matrix that uh, that is uh, not the final result, but uh, it allows us uh, uh, to uh, qu quite efficiently compute the. Uh, between this uh, in, in a network. Later, in 2001, uh, uh, Brandes proposed an uh, even faster algorithm. But before that, this uh, uh, algorithm based on uh, geode geodetic semiring was, uh, uh, was, uh, was used. Uh, then in, uh, in uh, social uh, network analysis, there are some uh, there are some uh, uh, problems uh, uh, with so-called signed networks. Uh, a network is signed if we assign uh, if we assign um, uh, as weights uh, uh, positive and uh, negative element uh, values to to arcs. So the relation can be positive or negative. And uh, now there are different questions. Uh, So-called uh, uh, balance uh, uh, problem deals with the question, is it possible to partition the, net, the signed network in two sets so that uh, 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 inside uh, uh, both sets, uh, we have only positive links and between sets, we have only uh, negative links. Uh, this problem was solved by, uh, by uh, Harari, uh, but it turns out that we can also use uh, uh, an appropriate semi-ring uh, to solve this problem. And this semi-ring is presented here. Now, if we generalize this question to uh, several uh, subsets, uh, we get a, a so-called partition or cluster uh, problem. And uh, again, also in this case, uh, we can use uh, 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 an appropriate semi-ring to solve this problem. I will uh, skip deep this. I'm quite uh, short in time, so I will just uh, 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 skip over uh, or uh, quickly uh, go through, through the, uh, the remaining examples. So one uh, uh, other option is to, to deal to have histograms as uh, uh, values or weights of, of the links. And uh, in this case, it turns out that we can uh, uh, define uh, uh, addition and multiplication of the values in the following ways. And uh, we get again a semi-ring that uh, allows us to uh, compute with uh, histograms. And uh, another thing is uh, uh, we can um, uh, attach to uh, each arc uh, uh, a so-called temporal quantity. Temporal quantity is describing how the value of the link is changing through time. And again, we can uh, define uh, addition and multiplication of such uh, weights. Now, to operationalize this, uh, we have to uh, restrict ourselves to, uh, to uh, temporal quantities that uh, are uh, constant on the intervals. And in this case, uh, for instance, uh, the addition and uh, uh, multiplication uh, can uh, uh, is represented here. For instance, if I have two temporal quantities, then the sum of these two temporal quantities is this one, 
and the uh, uh, product is uh, this one. So uh, now uh, to apply this, uh, we can uh, transform a network into the corresponding uh, temporal network. And it turns out that we can do this in, uh, in two different ways. One is uh, so-called instantaneous uh, description. For instance, if you have some uh, events and I have the date of that event, then instantaneous description is uh, to attach the temporal quantity uh, saying that on that particular moment, the uh, or interval, the, uh, uh, that uh, participant was active. In cumulative uh, description, uh, uh, you say from that uh, uh, particular moment on the uh, corresponding, uh, corresponding uh, actor or uh, participant was active. And this can be then applied uh, to different situations. Here I have an example of uh, uh, application of this idea to analysis of uh, uh, bibliographic networks. So uh, um, for instance, uh, in a particular case, if we take uh, a network uh, instantaneous description of a relation between journals and works, so here I have a two-mode network describing uh, for each uh, work uh, in which journal uh, it was published. Um, and then I have a citation network, which is also uh, instant, instantaneous description. And then I have again the same uh, 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 two-mode network. Uh, describing uh, relation between works and uh, the corresponding journals, but this time I have a cumulative uh, description. Then uh, uh, multiplying these uh, three networks, I obtain uh, a relation between uh, uh, journals, uh, is saying, telling me how, how uh, uh, often one journal is citing the other journal. Uh, now, in, if I take the diagonal element, I get uh, so-called self-citations. And for instance, here I have a uh, 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 temporal quantity describing the self-citations in cytometrics, but for a special bibliography on peer review. Uh, uh. And here I have uh, the corresponding uh, the corresponding uh, temporal quantities describing citations from plus one to uh, JAMA. And if I add all these things, I can get also the information about how others are uh, citing JAMA and uh, I get uh, a corresponding uh, uh, temporal uh, quantity. So uh, this um, 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 uh, well, we time. Yeah, I have to, to finish. Uh, uh, yeah. Right, thank you. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, just to finish, uh, I put my slides uh, on this uh, um, uh, uh, web page. So, if somebody is interesting, uh, he can download the slides from here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Vlado, for that wonderful overview of semi-rings um, on networks. Thank you. Um, we now have a, a short break, um, but we'll resume again. I uh, hope you've had a good break. Um, we've now got two more talks, um, both of which I'm looking forward to very much. And the first, uh, a warm welcome to John Levy-Martin, who's going to talk about algebraic structures for social data. John, over to you. Hi, today I want to talk to you about using algebraic structures to gain insight on social data that's about subjective phenomenon. You might wonder why, if you're interested in things like beliefs and attitudes, you might turn to algebraic structures. 
And I think the answer is a combination of push and pull factors. The biggest push factor is just the frustration with the limitations in our normal way of thinking about pretty much everything in the social sciences, which is to treat it as a continuous variable running from more to less, like everything is a temperature and you stick a thermometer into it. It does seem reasonable that at least some beliefs would have relationships that are treatable in logical terms, and that would certainly imply some kind of algebraic uh, conformity. But the big pull factor for me is the structuralist theory coming from Claude Levi-Strauss through Harrison White that urges us to look for the underlying generative structures that might explain the dispersion of data that we are confronted with. So today I'm going to be looking at data that's all of a single type, a single kind of Boolean data matrix, where we have n persons who form the rows here, who are asked about m different beliefs or items that they're at, uh, that they're confronted with, and they can either agree, accept the belief, in which case there's a one in that cell, or reject it, in which case there's a zero. Okay. Everything I'm going to be talking about mathematically is really straightforward, very simple. It's the applications and some of the theoretical implications that are interesting. Okay, so we're taking uh, data like this, and today I'm going to be assuming, and I'll say this a couple times, that all the persons and items are distinct. That is, there's no replication here. We could talk later about how we might deal with weighted data. And the question is, can we understand that observed data by retroducing a latent structure that we think in some ways generated the data that we observe. And so what we're going to be doing is restructuring the information in the data in different ways, depending on what strong theory we're trying to test about the nature of the data. Okay. So if we ask where do beliefs come from, if you ask a sociologist, they're almost certainly the first thing they're going to say is from other people, which is a reasonable idea. So let's first pursue the, the question of a generating social structure that's a specifically social structure, one that links people in flows of information transmission. We know that if we were to get longitudinal data where we ask people over and over again about the different things they believe, then even if we didn't know the underlying social structure of belief transmission, we'd have a pretty good guess. If person A always has a belief before person B does, probably A transmits to B. The question for us, though, is can we recreate a social structure from a single snapshot? And the answer is, well, you know, maybe we actually could. That's, of course, a very particular social structure. We're going to need to assume that some people are sources. They're influenced by no one. They create beliefs, and they can pass it on to others. Anyone who's not a source can only get a belief if it's passed on to them by someone who, uh, who already has it. But once they have that belief, they can pass it on to anyone else they influence. Now that implies that what we're doing is taking our original n by m data matrix and trying to retroduce an unobserved, a latent structure that would generate those sorts of data. And that structure I'm going to call a triset. I'm going to call it a triset because it's the sort of structure that if you uh, put it in matrix forms, you could permute the rows and columns so that it was upper triangular. More specifically, it's uh, anti-symmetric. So if one influences two, two doesn't influence one. It's reflexive, and it's acyclic, but it's not necessarily uh, transitive. So you'll see here that the transitively implied relationship between person two and person five is not present. This sort of structure makes a lot of sense for uh, informal social phenomena. Uh, what this structure would do is generate sets of what I'm going to call social belief states, which is a state of some piece of information or idea that's in the process of diffusing from the top to the bottom. So an example of a social belief state here is the column vector that corresponds to belief B. It was generated by person one who'd pass it on to person two, but it hadn't gotten any further. What we're going to be looking at is those sets of possible states. Again, I'm assuming that all persons and items are distinct. It isn't hard to show that a triset generates a particular algebraic structure on the set of possible states. It's one that's a lattice that's closed under union. Okay? That means that if we have 
or we're going to assume that a triset has generated our data, we're going to take our observed data and we might as well populate it with any unobserved unions among columns since we know those, are, those have got to be uh, possible under the theoretical form. What we want to do is from the existing lattice of belief states to reproduce the generating triset. It turns out, however, that we can't do that uniquely because more than one triset will generate the same lattice. However, there is a unique form of a triset that is uniquely related to any lattice closed under union, and that's the mediated triset. The mediated triset is one in which no transitively implied relations are present. So in this case, we don't need person one to directly influence person four, since person one's ideas could be passed on to person four by either person two or person three. So if we remove that relationship, then we have a mediated triset, and this is actually the structure that gener generated the lattice that I showed you before. And from that lattice, we can actually gener we can retroduce the triset that would have generated this, uh, this structure. How do we do that? First, we're going to focus on the join irreducible elements. Those are double outlined here. Uh, those are the ones that only cover one element. Uh, that is, there's only one line going up into them. Okay. Now, every one of these join irreducible elements can be given a label that corresponds to a person. It's the person, the unique person, who's just been added compared to the, uh, the, the, uh, the state that's being covered. So here I've labeled all the join irreducible elements uh, in those terms. So you can see that from the very bottom, we go from no one holding the belief to person one. Each join irreducible element thus corresponds to a person, although not uniquely. Each join irreducible element always covers another one, and the triset is contained here. So we see that person one uh, precedes persons two and three, and therefore can influence them. Uh, both two and three precede four, and because of this entry, where there's two people influencing the same one, we have a split in the structure, an interesting kind of uh, symmetry. And then person four can influence either five or six, okay? One particularly interesting kind of triset is what I'll call a tree set. That's where we don't have any of those in trees where two people influence the same person. It's, I'm calling it a tree set because the structure actually just takes on the form of a tree. This sort of structure generates a lattice of social belief states that's distributive, which means for Boolean vectors that it's closed under both union and intersection. And it also has a curious self-dual nature. There's a one-to-one -one mapping between the join irreducible elements and the meet irreducible elements, such that either one allows us to reproduce the underlying generating tree set. So here, the join irreducible elements are the ovals that have their labeling to the left, and the meet irreducible elements are the double outlines that have their label to the right, but the same partial order of the elements is seen in both of them, though in somewhat different in different ways. Okay, so what we've been trying to do is to take our n by n data matrix and use it to reproduce some kind of social structure that could have generated the data, uh, n by n matrix of some form. Now let's do the same thing but look at the, uh, the other way, where we're going to look to see if there's a structure among the beliefs that could generate the, uh, the distribution. Before we go further, I want to show you the Galois lattice of our example data, because it's the most common structure that's used in the social sciences for, such, for, uh, for these sorts of data, and we're going to want to compare different structures to this. So the Galois lattice, most of you know, it's a very convenient way for summarizing relationships of uh, inclusion and intersection among both rows and columns. Instead of going right to that useful summary, I want to ask a theoretical question. If we have a set of people who have different beliefs, could the structure come not from their social relations, but the logical, psychological, or sociological relations among the beliefs themselves? For example, could it be that there's some belief that you can't hold until you hold another belief? 
like for logical reasons, you might imagine that you can't hold Newton's uh, laws for planetary motion unless you already hold the preceding belief in the inverse square law of gravity. But there might be a psychological or sociological re relations that are similar. Can we uncover those? In this case now, we're looking at something that is dual to the social belief states we looked at before. Here we're looking at rows, each row giving us a possible combination of beliefs that a person can hold. So here person two holds beliefs B, D, F, and G. That's going to be a belief state. What we see when we compare these different belief states is that there's no viable belief state in which someone believes A who doesn't already have belief B. So we can say that belief B seems to precede belief A. We're going to imagine that there's a whole set of relations like that between the beliefs, so the beliefs form a partially ordered set. If indeed that's true, then the set of possible belief states will be a distributive lattice. Further, every meet irreducible element here will correspond to a unique item. And we can label each uh, meet irreducible element by the item that the state above it adds. So you'll see the, ver the at the very top, A, we can label that meet irreducible element A because the only thing that's missing there is A and that's added at the top state. If we look at the relations of precedence in the lattice between the different meet irreducible elements, we'll see that we've actually reproduced the partial order of the beliefs themselves. So we're able to reproduce that structure, the generating structure, from the distribution of all possibilities. Okay, and so there's the item partially ordered set. Again, because by definition, having the items take on this partially ordered set generates a space of possibilities that's a distributive lattice, a closed under union and intersection. If we have this theory, given a set of observations, we're going to need to populate it with any unobserved unions or intersections of observed rows. And so that can get a little bit big, as you see that our structure is relatively big, uh, given the, the small data matrix that we started with, right? But now, what if it turns out that we didn't actually measure the underlying belief components themselves? Instead, what we've measured are aggregates of belief components. So here, I want to pursue a somewhat different way of looking for an underlying structure of beliefs. I'm going, going to assume that there are discrete micro-beliefs that you can, anyone can hold or not hold, and that what we ask them about, following Ed Hertel and David Wiley, uh, compiles these different uh, micro-beliefs such that you can't answer a macro-belief, the compilation of the micro-beliefs, positively unless you have every single one of the micro-beliefs. So they're a logical structure that involves some kind of compilation via AND. Okay. Now that implies that the observed macro-belief state lattice is closed under intersection. And you'll see here that this is homologous to the Galois lattice that we saw before. So this can also be understood as a different interpretation of a Galois lattice. That's a much more parsimonious structure than when there's a partial ordering among the macro beliefs. Now we can create the micro belief inclusion matrix. That's a set of rules telling you what macro beliefs uh, it re requires which micro beliefs. We can recreate this from the meet irreducible elements which here are the red outline. So let's literally take these and make a matrix out of them. Just take those at one, we put, put it in, that's a row. Um, and we're going to have a matrix that has as many rows as there are meet irreducible elements and as many columns as there are observed macro beliefs. Okay. I'm going to call that matrix D. So we take that matrix and let's take its complement, okay, just exchanging ones and zeros. Now this gives us the set of relationships between the micro beliefs, which are going to be the, uh, the rows, and the macro beliefs, which are the columns. Here I've made it a little bit easier to see by instead of using ones and zeros, giving as lowercase letters the, the, each of the micro beliefs, the posited latent micro beliefs, for each of the observed macro beliefs. Okay. So the way we read this is that to hold macro belief E, that's the column beginning with E, someone would need to hold micro beliefs A, B, and D. Okay. We generated 
are hypothesized latent microglutes from the meat irreducible elements in the lattice, which means that we know by definition that each meat irreducible element corresponds to a microglute. So we can label each mire with the, uh, the row in the microbelief inclusion matrix that we, uh, we generated from it. Now we can also then discover what are the possible relationships of partial ordering among the microbeliefs from looking at their, uh, their relation in this matrix. So you'll see that the microbeliefs uh, A corresponds to a meat irreducible element that precedes the meat irreducible elements that correspond to the microbeliefs D and E. That means it's possible that microbelief A precedes microbelief D and that no one who holds microbelief D also doesn't hold microbelief A. Um, it's also possible that A precedes E and that B precedes both D and E. Other relationships, no other precedence relationships are possible. We can also reproduce the, the post set of possible relations between the macro belief from that inclusion matrix. Basically, macro belief A can precede macro belief B if there's no macro belief that a has that B doesn't also have. So you can say I would, you'd have to have me before you can have uh, have you. Okay. So what we've basically done here is taken our n by m matrix and make an m by k matrix that tells us what macro beliefs those are n macro beliefs include what micro beliefs where we're positing k micro beliefs where k is the number of meat irreducible elements. From that. We produce the k by k partially ordered set of relationships of precedence among the micro beliefs. From the m by k matrix, we can also reproduce the partially ordered set of relationships between the macro beliefs. Now that's where it gets interesting. We've been assuming so far that micro beliefs are dichotomous. You either hold one or you don't hold one. Uh, and then we've been assuming that they form a partial order. Once we make that leap that they could form a partial order, there's another way of interpreting the data that's a little bit different. Rather than thinking about partially ordered dichotomous variables, we could think about an underlying latent space that has ordinal dimensions. And this kind of interpretation of the same structure had been proposed a long time ago uh, by Clyde Coombs. So here's the way Coombs thought about things. Because he, you know, he's a psychologist. He's trying to think about different ways in which um, responses to discrete items might be evoking different kinds of latent factors. Okay? So his idea was that we might have a number of different dimensions, in this case we have two, that enter into a response process in a non-compensatory way. And that just means that having more of factor one can't make up for having less of factor two. It's an and process. You need both of them to answer any item correctly. So in this case, to answer the item D, correctly, you'd need to be above and to the right of the point in this space that has the letter D on it. Okay. So this is the example that Coombs gave, and it can be shown that if these, if you have these items, A, B, C, D, E, and F, that are positioned in this space, the set of all possible states actually corresponds exactly to this state, uh, to, to these spaces, and that it forms a lattice closed under intersection, and that the lattice relationships of covering uh, come from just being above and or to the right of uh, another, another one with nothing in between. Coombs knew how to generate observed possibilities from, uh, from a spatial representation like that, but he didn't really have the math down to go the other way. It turns out that we can recreate the possible spaces that generate any observed set of data using the micro belief post set that we've already uh, discovered. Actually, it's not so much the micro belief post set itself, it's the micro belief post set along with the incomparability graph among the micro beliefs. So the incomparability graph is just when we make an edge between any two micro beliefs, neither of which precedes the other. Okay, so these green relationships are the, the ones that don't proceed. They can't be linked in more or less. And so you might imagine that that would indicate the number of possible dimensions. And in fact, it's true. So any valid coloring scheme here where things of the same color never touch uh, corresponds to a dimensional solution because the click size here is three. It's pretty obvious that three dimensions are needed 
to uh, to reproduce this space. And in that ca in our case, that's exactly right. And any valid coloring is an acceptable dimensional theory. So it could be that we have a dimension that goes uh, from nothing to A to D, and another that goes from nothing to B to E, and another that just goes from nothing to C. Or it could be uh, a different one that goes one that links A and E in the same dimension and B and D instead. But these then generate ordinal spatial representations that would reproduce the observed data. So in other words, now what we've done is we've gone from that K by K microbelief pose set to an M by, I'm saying K star here, Coombs reduction because we now have uh, fewer dimension, potentially fewer dimensions than we have meet irreducible elements. And we're interested in how the observed macro beliefs might relate to these underlying dimensions. Okay. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, John, this sounds like the by order approach of Dornian and so on. They were doing exactly this, right? They were doing discrete non compensatory factorizations, but we all know that their structures are, that are generated aren't homologous to a Galois lattice. But what you just showed us, you said, was homologous. What's going on? And I think that's a really good question, and I want to answer it. But in case you don't remember, so the idea of the by-order approach was to take observed data and to turn it into what they called by-orders. A by-order meaning a, a matrix, sub-matrix, that both the rows and the columns can be permuted so that they're in order. So for example, we have here data from three people on three items, okay? And this data can be shown to be the intersection of these two Boolean matrices, that is element-wise intersection, is putting one on top of the other, right? Uh, the first and the second. What's special about these matrices, if you notice, is that each one could be permuted so that it's a triangle in, in some sense. But there are different orderings of, let's focus on the column elements. In one, item A comes before B, which comes before C. And in the other, item C comes before B, which comes before A. This is just like what Coombs was doing, where he was trying to put the items in different orders on two dimensions, right? So why isn't this the same as what Coombs was doing? Well, let's do just this. Let's put A, B, and C in two different orders on two different dimensions. So here one and one of them, A is the first and the other A is the last. And now I'm showing you the observed states that are present in the data that, um, that we, we had. And um, you, which is uh, that none of them exist, only A, only B, only C, or that they all exist because we know that as an algebraic structure, we need to add in the universal lower bound and the universal upper bound, okay? So if we were thinking this way, we can't help notice that the by order approach is forbidding us from occupying certain regions here. To Coombs, I believe that wouldn't have made any sense. Uh, he, I think, took the perspective that nature doesn't really make any jumps. And if you have a spatial representation, you should have other types of uh, possible states that the by order approach is forbidden. Right? Coombs, I think, would, would accept a different solution, which has three dichotomous dimensions, and there are no jumps, no tunneling through different parts of the space. So the two methods can give different solutions uh, in some cases, and we can say in advance when they give the same solution. And they do that when we don't have that kind of tunneling. Uh, when do we not have that kind of tunneling? It's when the lattice of belief states isn't simply closed under intersection, but is lower semi-modular. That implies that it's gonna be score graded. We don't see a jump from having one item, like just A, to having uh, three items, A, B, and C, without something in between. When the uh, the two are, are different, when the lattice of belief states is not lower semi-modular, the by-order approach might have fewer total dimensions, like in this case it is three dimensions. But it has more potential cells if you're thinking about it in the way in which the Coombs would think about it. He would say, well, you have three distinctions on uh, each of two dimensions, that should lead to nine possibilities, whereas the Coombsian solution of three dimensions 
only has eight possible places that people can exist, two times two times two. So in one sense, it's less parsimonious, and in another sense, it's more parsimonious. Okay, Whew. let me sum up. The two-mode belief matrix contains information, and we all know that we can reduce that information to the row space, and there's lots of techniques that are based on that, uh, like formal concept analysis and Galois theory, and all of that is just beautiful and elegant. But there might be times when we have a strong theory about the underlying structure that could generate the data. And in that case, we may want to pursue other algebraic structures, whether they're social or cognitive. And if we're lucky enough in our selection of observed states, we might be able to reproduce those generating structures. Thanks. Thank you so much, John. That was so clear. It's, uh, that was great. Um, so on to our second talk for this session, um, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Eric Darpo, who's going to talk about constructive semigroup theory. Um, thank you very much, Eric. So the uh, title of this talk is Constructive Semigroup Theory. It is based partly on joint work with Melanie Mitrovic. And there is a recent preprint with some our, on the archive with some of our results. Um, so my purpose of this talk is twofold. Uh, one is that I want to present to you the possibility of doing semigroup theory or more generally algebra in the framework of constructive mathematics. And secondly, I want to, I, I want to show you that in doing so, it may be a good idea to work with the concept of apartness. So when I'm speaking about constructive mathematics, then, I'm, then I mean mathematics that is done using intuitionistic logic instead of classical logic. And the, the point of doing this, or one important point of doing this, is that if we do so, then all our theorems, all our results will have a direct computational meaning. If I have a theorem telling you that there exists an object with certain properties, then my proof will in principle contain an algorithm for constructing that object. So, so mathematical results that are valid in constructive mathematics contain more information than, uh, than classical results. So, for example, now, if I, <clears throat> if I say that there exists some object X with some property P, what I am asserting is that I have some finite algorithms, one that constructs an object in the setting question, and one that verifies that this object indeed has the desired property. Similarly, or also, if I have if I claim that, if I make the statement P or Q, that means that I'm claiming that either I can prove the statement P or I can state, prove the statement Q. And of course, I know which one of them it is. So in particular, <clears throat> in particular, uh, the law of excluded middle saying that every statement is either true or false this is not valid in general, uh, constructively. Also, the classically true reductio ad absurdum, which says that if the, neg if the negation of P is impossible, then P holds. This is also not constructively valid. Of course, these, of course, these things can still be valid for certain, for certain statements P but they are not valid as general principles. And this kind of mathematics, it can be formalized using, for example, Martin Löw's constructive type theory or using the so-called constructive similarly Frankel axiom system, which is an adaption of the usual ZF to, to the constructive framework. And, and if you work with that using intuitionistic logic, you get the formalization of the things that we are doing. However, for us, the main point 
is not to study foundation. The, the main point for us is to do mathematics. I'm interested in seeing how much algebra can be developed in this, um, within this framework. And I want to stress that everything that is done constructively is also valid classically. So a constructive theorem is always a theorem in the classic mathematics, although there are many classical theorems which cannot be made constructively valid. So in this framework, uh, when we're speaking about the set, we need some additional, we need to be a little more careful. Uh, so to construct, to define a set, what we need to do is we need again to give some kind of algorithm which constructs elements in the set and we need to have some notion of equality. Uh, we need to be able to say when two elements in the set are equal. Um, so for example, mm, the real numbers, we can construct them as a set of rational Cauchy sequences. So by rational Cauchy sequence then, so that is a function from positive integers into rational numbers satisfying certain properties. And this function would have to be given by some finite algorithm. And we say that two Cauchy sequences are equal as real numbers, in the set of real numbers, by definition, if the difference between the terms go to zero, as we are used to. Uh, one thing that to keep in mind here is that we, that we, when we're dealing with sets in this way, we need to make sure that the functions, subsets, etc., are extensional. That is, they are compatible with the equality relation. The value does not depend on the particular representative for, for an equality clause, so to speak. Um, Right, and in this context, it turns out that uh, quite much of the fundamental constructions and theorem that we <coughs> that we do, they still work. Right? Sometimes you need to modify the proof. Sometimes you will need to modify even to modify the statement to make it valid constructively. Uh, but many of the most basic things. Still can still be made work to uh, made to hold with some work. These examples include the isomorphism theorems, uh, Cayley's and Benning theorem, Reed's congruence, Green's relations, and other things too. So uh, <clears throat> yeah, so some things in some in some ways things work as we hope that they would. On the other hand, of course, sometimes things just don't work. Particularly, this is problematic when we are dealing with infinite structures, because at the kind of at the heart of the philosophy here is that we want everything to be able to, to be kind of constructible by finite algorithms. And when we're dealing with infinite structures, our finite algorithms might not be enough to give us what we want. So, for example, I would like to show to you that you cannot show, prove that the real numbers under multiplication form a zero group, so a group with a zero element appended. So, uh, <clears throat> so let, to, do, to see this, let x, so let xn, I should say, for n being a positive integer, being defined as a rational number, you take sum of k from 2 to the n of some number a k, over 2 to the k, where a k by definition is zero if I can write 2k as a sum of two primes. Now clearly this is the, whether or not 2k can be written as a sum of two primes, this is a something that can be decided just by checking the number of primes. And, I, and if it can't, I, I, I say that AK is one. 
And looking at the expression for my terms xn, it is kind of clear that they form a Cauchy sequence. In other words, this sequence is a real. So now let us assume that uh, let us assume that that R is a zero group. which I will just write like this, right? Then it follows that, <clears throat> then it follows that either X is here or it is here. So X is either zero or X is invertible. So there exists some Y such that X times Y is equal to one. Um, and in the former case, all the all the xn's have to be zero because this is a non-decreasing sequence, and uh, it follows particular that all these numbers a k have to be zero. On the other hand, if if um, x is invertible, basically by usual proof or rather standard proof, you can show that there exists some n such that x n is non-zero, so it's positive, right? Uh, and consequently there has to exist some k such that a k is one. And now if we look at the uh, <coughs> at what we have actually proved here, so I'm have, uh, what I'm saying here is that what I'm saying here that is that either this holds or this holds and I know which alternative it is. And in case the first condition, in case the first holds, that means that Goldbach's conjecture holds. Goldbach's conjecture says that every even integer can be written as a product of two primes, as a, as a sum of two primes, sorry. And on the other hand, in the second alternative, I have given a counterexample to Goldbach's conjecture. So, with the with the in the in the constructive framework, with the interpretation of the disjunction that we have, the statement that R is a zero group can only be shown if we are able to decide whether or not Goldbach's conjecture is true or false. And to my knowledge, this is still an open question. And even if it were not an open question, even if it turns out that th this morning someone actually proved, Gold uh, proved or disproved Goldbach's conjecture, then we will change this sequence into encoding some other open problem in mathematics. Right? So constructively, we have kind of reached a limit here. We cannot, we cannot give this statement a constructive proof. So, um, one way of trying to get around this trouble, of course, we want, we want a such a fundamental structure as a real number, we want it to have the nice properties that we are used to. And one way of kind of working around this question is to introduce a notion of apartness. So, an apartness is a binary relation on a set satisfying three conditions. The first is that it is irreflexive, so no element is apart from itself. Secondly, it is symmetric. And thirdly, it is co-transitive, which means that whenever I have two elements x and y which are apart from each other, then any other element z has to be apart either from x or from y. So in, if you're using classical, if you're using in classical mathematics with classical logics, being in a partners relation is just the same thing as being the negation of an equivalence relation. However, constructively, this is not possible to prove in general. And that is why we are led to studying 
the concept of apartness separately. So in R, with, uh, in the real numbers then, with an appropriate notion of apartness, which I've written here, you can show that the subset consisting of all numbers which are apart from zero form a group and a multiplication. Classically, this is equivalent to saying that R is a zero group. Again, constructively, as we can see, there's a difference between this statement, which we can prove, and this statement, which we can't prove. So, with this introduction, uh, let's look at semi -books. So, this is hopefully some kind of motivation to why we why it might be a good idea to work with algebraic structures with an apartment. So, so for semigroups, this means that we take a semigroup, we introduce an apartness relation to this semigroup as a set, and in addition, we need kind of compatibility condition with the multiplication in order to make things work out good. So this says that if x times y is apart from z times w, then either x is apart from z, or y is apart from w. And this is, I mean, this is something that we need to make that work out. And uh, <clears throat> so we have introduced this apartness, then there is some work to be done. We need to show, we need to make sure that whenever we are proving theorems, whenever we're making constructions, that the, that the apartness can, take, can be taken on board too, that this you, that these constructions and theorems work fine with apartments. And most of this work has been done by the Serbian school uh, around Slavenkovic, Mitrovic and Romano. They have proved, among other things, that the first isomorphism theorem works, or she's embedding theorems and also other results. In addition to this, there is a, some recent work by Cherubin and Frigieri who have studied inverse semigroups with apartments. Now, as, a, as, an, ex, as an example uh, of, the kind of, of the kind of uh, problems or considerations that you are led into, I would like to show you a little about the Ries confidence. So we're having a semigroup with a partners, and we have an ideal inside of that semigroup. We can form the Ries factor, the Ries factor semigroup, and then if we want to deal with a partners, well, then we need an apartness relation on that factor group, factor semigroup. And uh, the problem is that it is not completely clear in this in this setup. It is not completely clear how to do this, and I I am not aware of any general method for finding an apartness on this on this Ries factor. Uh, However, so again, we are forced then to a kind of uh, work around. So instead of starting from an ideal, we will start from so-called the, the from a dual notion of a co-ideal or an anti-ideal, uh, which in some way axiomatizes what in in the classical concept it, in the in the classical situation being a co-ideal is the same as being the complement of an ideal, but again, in constructive in constructive context, this is not exactly this is not always possible to prove. So, a co-ideal by definition uh, is a subset such that if you have a product belonging to the co-ideal, then both of the factors will have to belong to the ideal as well, and and. Uh, Classically, I think you can see that this precisely tells you that you are a complement of an ID. Secondly, for any X in, Z, in S, for any A in A, either X has to be in A or X has to be apart from this element A in A. This again, this is a compatibility condition 
uh, that tells us that this set in some way is compatible with the partners. Uh, I will not dwell up. I will not dwell upon this technicality. Then you can define. In this case, you can define a binary relation on, on S. In this way, you say that X and Y are related if first they are apart, and then and secondly, if at least one of these of these elements is in A. So the idea here of thinking of A as the complement of an ideal, well, if you're <clears throat> if you're thinking about what happens, what happens if this is not true? Well, either they are not apart from the beginning, or if this is not true, that would mean that would mean that both of them are inside of the complement of the ideal, which complement ideal, I wrote it, write this as negation A. And if both of them are inside of the complement of, of A, that means that they are going to be identified in the refactor group. Um, so the result here then is to say that if you have a co-ideal, its complement is an ideal, and if you take the Riesz factor with respect to that ideal, you, this ca the re relation kappa, which I defined, is in a partner's relation on that mm, on that fa on that factor set. So we could not start in general with an ideal, but we could start with a co-ideal, which classically is completely dual to the notion of an ideal, to construct this Riesz factor with the partners. So as I said, the complement of, of a co-ideal is an ideal, the complement of an ideal, we may not be able to prove that it is a co-ideal. And more general, and this is kind of a more, it's a special case of a somewhat more general um, <clears throat> situation, where you have some congruence row, I have written here, um, given by some construction. And if you want to define an apartness relation on the factor semigroup, you will need something which is a dual notion, constructed friend, as we call them, of row, of a, of a, of a, of a congruence. We call that a co-congruence. And we need that co-congruence to be compatible with the congruence in the sense that their intersection is empty and depending on the construction you can you can const uh, there are different ways of constructing these um, these congruences and co-congruences so one example of this is what I showed you above um, at this point I would just like to mention so you can go through the basic you can go through the basics um, the constructions you can try to make things work and up to now things have been quite well. One challenge, one challenging problem I think for a future would be to see whether you can prove like some some analog or some something similar to the Reese structure theorem for the completely zero simple semigroups. If you are going to do this I'm pretty convinced that you will need an apartness relation, otherwise things are gonna get very difficult. But I am, th this is completely open. I do not know whether or not it is possible, but it's up there as a challenge to all of you. Thank you for your intention, for your attention. That is my talk. Thank you so much for another wonderful talk. I think we've been um, blessed with many interesting talks this morning. So should we get the discussion underway then? And I think this is an opportunity for anyone to ask anyone who's spoken a question. <laughs> and there've been so many interesting um, talks over the last uh, two days already that um, I hope there's lots of questions. So who'd like to go first? And I think because we're not a huge group, um, just uh, unmute yourself and ask.
Okay, can I start? Yes, please do. So as uh, as uh, let me let me comment a little bit our last talk, uh, Eric's talk. See, uh, uh, you know, and all of us are more or less familiar with classical semi good theory and uh, their applications. So as for constructive semigroup with the partners, it is a new theory. It is recognized as a new theory, which we start to develop, uh, I don't know, since uh, uh, 2000, maybe even before some initial definition were given by uh, Daniel Romano, then we joined a team and then we uh, made this theory to grow. What is interesting, uh, what give us impetus to say to go further, we found application in artificial intelligence area. Uh, ah. Yeah, yeah, when we found that uh, semi-groups with the partners are mentioned there, but believe me, it is uh, uh, it is right in the sense of the word, they were mentioned. So in 2000, beginning of 2000s, a group from Nijmegen University in Holland formalized on uh, proof assistant cock, fundamental proof assistant cock, I think, uh, or I hope you more of you are familiar with this. It is a proof assistance with intuitionistic logic as a background. So Niemann group uh, formalized fundamental theorem of algebra. Uh, constructive version, constructive, uh, constructive version of fundamental theorem of algebra. Uh, in doing so, uh, they, uh, it was needful for them to uh, make, to construct uh, some kind of algebraic hierarchy. And in that, uh, in that uh, uh, initial and basic work, they mentioned, of course, they start with, uh, you will see tomorrow, setoid with the partners, and then they defined semi-group with the partners. But the semi-group were uh, with one axiom more, which uh, uh, difference uh, with our definition of semi-group with the partners. Uh, more about that, I will, I will talk about that tomorrow. So uh, this is a very good opportunity for all of us here, coming from, uh, from semi-group theory as kind of uh, other algebraic theory, and you people who applied our mathematical knowledge just to announce and to say that we have another new theory available for future work, and that we are very, very interested uh, to progress in that direction. That is all for now from my That's side. Um, really helpful and interesting observations. Um, and I do think there is a lot to explore there. So thank you. Are there other comments? I'm yes. just curious about uh, the application of semi rings and kinship networks. Uh, and Vladimir Batagel didn't have the time to do. Perhaps if he can do some words on that. Thanks, Antonio. Vlado, are you there? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> do you have some question? Yes, Antonio was asking about the application of. Uh, semi rings to the kinship um, example. Well, yeah, how to say uh, in uh, kinships uh, you have the, that was uh, uh, the final part. Uh, essentially, it turns out that uh, most of the kinship terms can be, at least in in our uh, society. Uh, because there are different societies and they have different uh, kinships. So 
there can be uh, a lot of uh, discussion about this, but uh, if we limit ourselves to, let us say, Western kind of uh, kinship, then these terms can be uh, expressed by some uh, basic terms, like uh, to be parent, to be uh, uh, child, uh, uh, to be woman and to be man. And uh, uh, most, most of, uh, of the operations are uh, just union and multiplication. And here you have a same ring. But in, uh, in general, it turns out that in many cases, we have much richer structures than just uh, same rings. So we have some additional uh, operations. And uh, um, when I started to, to, to uh, work on this, uh, in in the uh, 70s, uh, uh, I was quite involved in uh, formal language theory. And in formal language theory, you have quite, quite interesting uh, 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 structures called uh, re regular algebras and so on. So, and uh, one of the things I think uh, which I, uh, uh, I think it could be interesting is uh, uh, because most of the, let us say, this um, um, theory uh, 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 applications of algebra to, let us say, block modeling and uh, similar things is uh, just limited to, to semi-groups. But I think one uh, quite important thing uh, would be to extend this idea to induce other uh, uh, algebraic structures. Uh, I, I have this in mind for some times, but I, uh, I never had time to, 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 to drill in. So, uh, but this would be uh, uh, quite an interesting uh, application. I completely agree, Vlado. And I don't know about you, but I think even, um, you know, we've been, t we've all been talking, we from the social sciences I'm referring to about um, some work um, that some of us um, did quite a long time ago, but I've got really reconnected really and really interested in pursuing some, some additional questions and I, I hope it's the same for you too. Okay, any further questions? Okay. I have may, may, I, may I ask Eric to revert back to the difference between the notion of set in constructive saving groups and in classical ones? Eric, do you wish me to share my notes again or? Oh, just replay, re explain a bit. Right. I mean, I mean, I guess there are technical, uh, there, I guess there are technical differences and philosophical differences. So I think, uh, I mean, and the technical the technical differences, of course, they get, uh, they ultimately got down, get down to the foundations, right? We in classical mathematics we use ordinary ZF and probably also the choice axiom and so on. In in uh, uh, <clears throat> so so in the, but, but from a more philosophical point of view, the main thing with the constructive notion is again that you have to have an explicit construction a method for constructing the elements. Uh, <clears throat> right, so this is, this is kind of the main, I think, I think philosophical difference if you don't deal with sets which have not been defined. And then we have a, 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 another aspect of this is that, so there are different schools of constructive mathematics, but if you were following Bishop, we are dealing with we are thinking of we are dealing with equality as being some explicitly defined relations between elements that have been constructed, as for example the example which I gave about real numbers being the construction gave us those Cauchy sequences and then we have to define then we are we are defining an equality relation on the on the set of Cauchy sequences or the collection of Cauchy sequences. That is a little more technical thing. This, this turns out to be handy when you are, when you are kind of uh, codifying this in, into type theory, for example. But maybe that is more on the technical end of the spectrum. I don't know if that answered your question or if it's something else. 
we'll continue discussing later. <laughs> That's good. And okay. actually, I had a quick question. Sorry, Dragana, please. Uh, yes, so I'm not sure uh, if it is uh, for Eric or for previous speaker. Uh, one of you mentioned that social relations that you're looking into, of course, are culturally dependent. Uh, when you're looking into uh, developing algebraic structure around uh, social relations, what is your inspiration in terms of culture? Uh, what are your assumptions? I can answer. So it is, uh, if I understand Dragana, your question uh, good, in a good way. So if, uh, uh, if you, uh, it comes actually, uh, the idea about this difference came from uh, Boris Schein review of John Paul Boyd's book, because he wrote, this was uh, John Paul Boyd's is an excellent book. The first one I, with, where, where I faced with uh, so fruitful application of semi group theory. But actually, before I have a John Paul Boyd book in my hand, I have read a Boris Schein review on uh, John Paul Boyd's book uh, in semi group theory, was this review. So Boris Schein is a big semi group figure. And as he came from Russia, uh, he moved from Russia to USA, and there he proceeded with his career. See, he's very familiar with, uh, with the language, with the language uh, and the notion in connection with, uh, with in differences in connection with kinships. So, for example, in Russia, in Poland, in Serbian, we make a difference between, and we have a different notion for a brother of my father and for a brother of my mother. This is a different. So I think that this is uh, uh, this uh, defining, starting defining uh, uh, things about kinship relations, uh, which depend of actual language, are, are something which we talk about and something which was mentioned here. Thank you, know. Melania. That's very interesting. So you are not speaking in terms of having different linguistic term for a brother, mother's brother and father's brother, but you are talking about actually relationships within family that they are different with these, let's say two people. Is that what you're saying? Relation types of relations are different. You are not talking about having a language term. For example, no. un uncle, you know, here you would say uncle for uh, both, I, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah, both. And you would say uyak and streets. Yeah. And you are not talking about language, uh, these two terms, you are talking about relationship. Yeah, but if I defined, uh, for example, in, if I'm working mathematics in Serbian and I defined my relation to be uncle or to be street brother of my father, then it is different relation. It's different, different definition of relation. To the, I I, then I have two definitions. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe... They, I will obtain the similar properties if I generalize them. If I generalize their properties, and then I uh, completely forgot about that it is a people, a related people. When I talk about abstract elements, abstract sets, and what, that is what we algebraists do actually. We start with uh, examples, and then we extract the properties and then we proceed with some general structures, more general structures. We don't consider people, we consider objects with have these or that properties. It's a great question, um, Drago, and I think Melani has given a great answer. Um, but John, um, John Martin or John Boyd, do you want to add anything? I know you've both had a, a lot of thought and there's a rich thread of work on, um, on this question. Well, 
I've just woken it up, but <laughs> what's the question again? <laughs> it's about what assumptions are made about culture in analyzing um, algebraically um, some relational uh, data or in building an algebraic representation? Well, you know, in uh, kinship studies, there is a uh, a defined method for uh, for eliciting the uh, the kinship relations that you've been talking about. It's called the Rivers method. Some guy named Rivers back in um, 1903 developed this a systematic way of more or less subjectively uh, 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 finding out um, these relations. And, and, and what you do is first you ask about specific people and then you get the specific relationship as much as you can. He's my, he's my father's older brother. Sometimes you have to specify older or younger brother. And then you say, well, what do you call him when you're referring to him? And then they might say uncle or they might say father. Uh, and, and it's a fairly systematic way of uh, trying to figure out um, uh, kinship relations. Mostly it's on a semantic level. And there's nothing really deep about uh, how you interact with these people. I mean, you can make, you can make, uh, uh, you can make up ideas about it. For example, in uh, English, in, uh, uh, we have a lot of relatives that are called cousin. And uh, so one kind of Marxist interpretation of that is that we're trying to slough off all those relatives. And if <laughs> someone is a cousin, we don't have to share our, our money with them. Uh, but that's not spe specifically within this method of kinship, gathering kinship terms and classifying them. Thanks, John. And I was also thinking about the difference between, uh, let's say, uh, Anglo-Saxon culture, which you explained, where we call everybody cousin, second cousin, uh, 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 second removed cousin, and so on, uh, compared to what I know from our area close to Serbia, and that's Montenegro where they have specific names up to seven, I think, or maybe even more generations of people. Can you imagine that, that family tree that goes seven levels deep and each person, depending on relationship, has a particular name. Uh, it's not second removed or third removed, but specific name. So it, it would be interesting to see how that affects uh, the structures, certainly linguistic uh, or semantic structure it affects. Absolutely. This is a great question. And let's pick it up um, in the discussion tomorrow. Um, and I better hand over to Norbert since I've eaten already into the time for the next session. Norbert, over to you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Pip. Now let us invite Antonio Riveri Ostois to give his talk addressing algebraic modeling of multi-level network. Thank you very much. Now, I hope you can hear me. I'm really happy uh, and honored to be here with uh, such a great presenters and people who had a lot of influence in my research and in my work. Um, I'm going to share my screen um, and uh, my talk is about uh, an algebraic modeling of multi-level networks. Uh, this is an ongoing research. Um, as you can see, I am from the School of Culture and Society, which is the Faculty of Arts at the University of Aarhus, where we have um, plenty of problems uh, and um, empirical issues that we want to solve with the aid of mathematics. And I've been learning a lot of, uh, since you, uh, from this presentation. Um, I, uh, I'm going to talk about 
three points basically uh, and start with uh, the empirical uh, problem, the empirical uh, data to, to deal with, uh, which is uh, the multi-level structure of G20 countries network. Uh, this uh, network is, uh, is also multiplex or multi-relational and also valued, it's a valued structure. Uh, once I present uh, the empirical, we go to the more abstract uh, part, which is the algebraic analysis of this network. And uh, specifically with uh, two concepts, the relational and role structures. And for this, um, we're going, well, I'm going to apply uh, some algebraic systems that you already know. One is a partially ordered semi-group for the within relations and then uh, the framework of uh, formal concept analysis for to complement the uh, cross uh, domain relations and the third point is what i want to communicate as a social science uh, this um our way to um benefit from mathematical thinking is about uh, implementations perhaps in some computer programs and I developed two of them uh, to perform al algebraic analysis in, in the computer language called R. Uh, okay, I start by some, some definitions. Um, and I'm, the, a formal definition for a multi-level multi network that I'm going to use uh, during this talk uh, has uh, two domains of, uh, of vertices or, or, or nodes, if, if you want. One I, I call N and the other M, which is, will be the codomain. Um, and uh, uh, different sets of edges, uh, one in the domain, one in the codomain, one of these can be empty, but there is also a cross domain uh, relationships uh, sets in, in, in the multi-level multi structure. In case where uh, the edge is set for N and the edge is set for M is empty, so we are talking about, about a bipartite network or two-mode network, or in sociology we call it affiliation network, where we only have uh, cross-domain relations. Um, in a valued, valued network or weighted, we add uh, the weights and in multiplex systems, uh, multi-relational systems, we add um, different types of edges for different types of types of relations. And then um, we have uh, heard about the interlock, the tie interlock in multi-relational networks. So, here are some key concepts or key notions to, to, to emphasize. One is uh, that in simple networks, uh, we talk about social structure, which is the configuration made of uh, ties between actors. And many times uh, social networks are uh, large configurations that need to be reduced in order to to perform at least a direct analysis uh, or some interpretations. And um, in multi-level networks, a positional system will be reducer structures of actors and events. The domain correspond to the actors and the codomain to the, to the events. Uh, then we have uh, in multiplex networks where there are different types of relations, the relational structure, which, um, um, would represent the interrelations between the ties. So this is a higher level of uh, abstraction than the social structure. And then the reduced the, uh, relational structure will be called the role structure where we have a system of aggregated relations. Um, we use algebraic objects to represent uh, relational and role structures. And the idea basically is to apply this uh, configurations, relation and role structure to multiple networks. Um, so we, we um, present the, the data, uh, the multi-level structure of G20 
20 countries or the group of 20. And uh, the relations in the domain is, correspond to uh, uh, trade flow relations. In this case, as an example, there are two commodities, um, fresh milk and honey, and the trade between some G20 countries, uh, some G20 countries, not all of them, um, and are represented as a directed graph, um, where red uh, arcs are honey and blue for fresh milk. Now the affiliation part, the, the, uh, here uh, uh, there is a clustered bipartite uh, graph where we have uh, actors as circles and events as squares. And then we have a different type of, of, of events, different type of organization. One are bridges between advanced economies and emerging economies. Uh, and some uh, affiliations are only between emerging economies and some affiliations are only between advanced economies. And that's very interesting and useful information um, for the analysis. Uh, furthermore, among the uh, bridge organizations, there are some, some are redundant, which um, will connect precisely the same um, actors and then one way to I think Justin can yeah <laughs> yeah thanks um, one way to uh, simplify will be just to um, to take the non-overlap bridge or, or organizations uh, events these are organizations that uh, you need to pass through them in order to connect some certain actors in this in this network so this is going to be the structure the the, 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 the affiliation um, structure to work for the algebraic analysis um, a plot of the multi-level structure will be then uh, it can be made in different ways uh, one is the binomial projection when we have a um, a system of actor and events uh, with the different colors of the within uh, domain relations. And then we add um, relations for the affiliation of, from the actors to the events. Uh, this is a concentric layout. Uh, you can do that. And then ba basis on, on, on theory or substantial um, aspects, we reduce in this case, based on their affiliation, we reduce to three classes of actors. Antonio, and the actors. I'm sorry, Antonio. Yes. I'm sorry for interrupting. You are not showing a slide. I'm you are just showing the first two. Did you well, want more? It must be a problem with. Uh, yes. yes, you have to move the slide. Thank you. I'm moving the slide. That's really weird. But we, we just see the first two. Hmm. What about now? Just a second, so. It's good now. Yeah, well, I'm going to go to go to, to this other. Uh, now, do you see the moving? Can you see? Not moving. Mm. Should I have to re-enter? Uh, so I'm... Everything in the show itself screen. Maybe. Oops. I have to share it again. Antonio, maybe you should share the whole screen. Try to sh share the whole screen by right. Now, can you see? Now. It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sorry about this. I, I was looking the movement. Um, well, you saw these two slides. This is the formal definition of multi-level network with a domain and a codomain and the set of uh, edges in the domain and cross-domain. And then the notions that we're talking about, 
the, the presentation will be available on GitHub. Uh, and then the presentation of, of the network. First, we have the thread network in the domain and then the cross uh, relations as a bipartite graph um, and where we distinguish three types of events. Here are the advanced economies and the emerged economies. And this is an important information. And then we have some bridge events uh, that we ca can be simplified based on affiliations to this uh, network, which will be the basis for the algebraic analysis. Uh, this is the binomial projection of the multigraph uh, of the multi-level uh, network where uh, the affiliations are vertices and the ties to the affiliations are, are, are plotted as well. This will be a positional system. Uh, this will be a positional system of the uh, of the multi-level multigraph, where we classify the actors according to their affiliations. And here we have two a uh, couple of events that are structurally equivalent because they connect precisely to the same individual classes so we can join them into one class and make a skeleton with the structural uh, equivalence applied. So this uh, very simple multi-level uh, network, which is valued, is going to be uh, the object for an algebraic analysis. These are the image matrices representing the multi-level positional system. Um, now we go into relational and role structure, and this is the algebraic analysis of this multi-level configuration, which is the positional system of the G20 countries with bridges. Well, the definition of semi-group, you are familiar with that. I just want to emphasize that if, for social science, we work with semi-group of relations where the ties uh, are called generators or primitives, and then we have the compounds and elements in the semi-group of relations are unique representatives of strings of these generators and compounds and representative strings because there will be other compounds or probably generators that will be equated, that will link precisely the same um, individuals. And then we have to choose the unique uh, representatives. Um, a semi-group, which a partial order, where uh, some relations are contained into another is called an, a partial, partially ordered semi-group. And then we move to the representation, graphical representation of semi-group. Semi-groups can be uh, graphical depicted as a Kiley graphs, uh, where we have, uh, with respect to generating sets, whenever these conditions are met. Uh, an example of the Kiley graph, we have this uh, integers under addition. Uh, this is actually a group, more than a semi-group, because the invertibility, invertibility characteristics applies. Uh, and the generators, mm, determine which, which uh, shape uh, the edges will have. Uh, so the di diagonal in this case is the identity and the off diagonal is, is the other element. The, in this case, the, this is the multiplication table that um, coincides with the edge table. The edge tables only have uh, generators in the columns, and this is the edge table is sufficient to depict the Kiley graph. If we have a semi-group with compounds here, we only will use the information in the in the edge table. Now, uh, the framework of formal concept analysis will allow us to to connect the do, the two domains, and we have a previous talk with uh, about the Galois lattice. Galois lattice are based on Galois derivations between uh, indents and uh, extents in, in, the, in, in the affiliation network, which is represented as a formal context. Um, uh, mm, 
there is also a hierarchy um, in this um, among the concepts will uh, will allow us to construct the concept lattice of the context, we, which is actually the Galois lattice. Um, there is formal definition there, and here we have uh, the uh, uh, Kiley graph of the semi-group um, of the multilevel structure, where both um, milk and holly relations are depicted, but also the, relation, the affiliation relations uh, with these letters uh, to, to represent. Uh, we have this uh, compound, which is milk and bricks, which is uh, the absorbing element in a Kiley graph absorbing uh, and identity elements tend to be placed in the, at the center in case we use a force directed layout. This is a force directed layout where we have uh, attracting and repulsing forces among between the vertex. It's also possible to use other uh, layout algorithms for, for, for the visualization, but in this case, uh, it produced some, some structure. Uh, the inclusion diagram is part of the partially ordered semi-group where the uh, compounds are uh, um, where the strings are in form of hierarchical structures. Uh, here we have the absorbing and then the strings that will cover the rest. Now, this is uh, the cross domain relations, and this is the Galois lattice, the concept, uh, the concept uh, lattice, where we have both. Uh, the domains and the codomains integrated in an ordering structure. This is with the full labeling, which means that the elements are, are um, repeated, but it's possible to have a reduced labeling where uh, the attributes on, on the top are the most important and in, in the minimum will be removed and dually for, uh, for the objects will be the objects in the bottom keep and uh, those that cover are redundant. Um, like here, this is at the full and reduce it. In this case, with two class position system, if we dis discharge a MITCA, which is a separate uh, component in the multilevel structure. So these three um, configurations represent algebraically uh, the multi-level network. Now, the thing what uh, is important for social scientists and humanities is to get access uh, to, to, to be able to perform this type of uh, visualizations because visualizations helps the analysis and also the, uh, the algebraic analysis. And that's, this is because my background is in social science and I, uh, these programs uh, multiplex I started as, while I was a visitor at the University of Melbourne and then multigraph while I was working at the University of August University. And before I had uh, some uh, Before it was together, but I'm, uh, this is just an example how it works. Uh, we get uh, the affiliation data, the value uh, trade network data. We have the clustering of the ac uh, actors. And then when we get to the multi-level structure, we get the, uh, we combine the trade network and the affiliation network with, with this function for multiplex. Uh, we use uh, uh, co-affiliation, that's one possibility, and um, bipartite networks. And then the, the visualization, we can put Please some characteristics. Conclude. It concludes. Yes. Uh, yeah. And, and then multigraph will pr produce a multi-level graph and then mm, the position system 
and the relational structure is and an, in another in another um, file which before was together uh, this is our our way to put in a relational manner the affiliations we we yes. get uh, the affiliations in this way with these matrices so it's possible to integrate in for, for the semi-group construction we bin these matrices for for the cross domain relations with with the trace and then it will we use the semi-group functions to construct the semi-group which by default is in a numerical format numerical format has the advantage we can see the absorbing element as 18 and here we have the strings relations it will take the full label of the strings but we can simplify and make a symbolic format of the semi-group in this way with this function the string relations with all the equations are obtained with the string function and this string function is the ingredient for the partial order table which will produce the function partial order we assure that is not valued because in this way it will it will be faster uh, computationally and for the visualization we can uh, customize uh, the equalities uh, pa was the the absorbing element but there are many other components that equals pa and in this case i decide to use uh, the composition of mills and bricks because it was an economy and then I just changed that and the function cc graph which stands for Kyle graph will plot you the Kyle graph uh, the function diagram will plot the partial or the closure lattice uh, of the partial order semigroups and then the Galois connections within form of concept analysis has another function that's called Galois in multiplex that will give you the both the full and reduces leveling and this is also the ingredient this output is the ingredient to make up uh, the concept lattice the ordering of the different concepts which will be uh, plotted with the diagram function uh, now there's one thing a, a small network can produce a huge uh, semi-group and that's something that has to be dealt one way is the composition multiplex has a uh, two different functions to perform a semi-group decomposition one is factorization for partially ordered semi-groups and the other is congruence it's for the congruence relations in abstract semi-groups with not partial order with big concept like Professor Ostois, Professor have, Ostois, please conclude, please conclude. Yes, yes. We have also order filters and other ideas to sweep chains in the concept lattice. And that's uh, for me, thank you. Thank you very much. Let's now listen to Professor John Paul Boyd, who will talk about semi-groups Kinship and the toy, tortoise and the head. All right. Yes, I'm uh, one of these people at uh, Irvine, which was one of the uh, um, centers for uh, the study of uh, social relations. Uh, thanks to Lynn Freeman and uh, uh, and his uh, energy. Uh, okay, let's go. Let's go to the next slide. This is kind of an outline of what I'm going to talk today. Uh, I was. I'm going to talk about kinship systems as an organizing principle, and to try to justify that that uh, you can uh, look at them with a uh, uh, inverse semigroups. I, I uh, 
looked at my paper on the subject <laughs> and 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 I find some fault with my own paper written, written way back then. Uh, I don't know. I, I guess you cannot uh, continually update your own papers. Um, I will also mention uh, something about, uh, a few things I've learned since then. Well, in thinking about this uh, uh, talk, I've learned something called a, a chart and paths as a way of representing uh, uh, inverse semigroups, groups, at least uh, finite inverse semigroups. groups. That's analogous to the uh, notation, the psycho notation for uh, finite permutation groups. Also, I'm going to uh, mention something uh, that I aspire to uh, learn about. It's called analytic combinatorics. This is a fantastic field that uh, that combines uh, uh, analysis, combinatorics, and uh, al algebraic uh, 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 approaches to combining uh, 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 algebraic uh, com uh, combinatoric systems. And then uh, I'm going to end with an amusing um, description of a uh, uh, finite uh, cyclic semigroups, uh, also known as uh, monogen monogenic se semigroups, and there's a uh, algorithm uh, known as the tortoise and the hare from uh, Aesop's fable. Uh, Whether, well, if you recall, the hare uh, and the tortoise were going to race, and the hare was so overconfident. That when he 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 started to run, but then he took a nap. Meanwhile, the tortoise, slow but steady, uh, overtook him and won the race. Uh, well, that's actually the sort of the basis of this algorithm, uh, attributed to uh, someone named Floyd, who has contributed many famous algorithms to uh, to uh, uh, finite mathematics. So uh, here are some of the first references. Of course, uh, everyone speaking about semigroups talks about Clifford and Preston. Can you see that highlighting in the blue? Okay, that's, uh, I remember the first time I heard about uh, Clifford and Preston. I was sitting in, uh, I was a graduate student at Michigan in 1962 or three, and I was sitting in the, uh, the bullpen in this uh, Mental Health Research Institute where I worked, where they put all the graduate students. We didn't have our own offices, but we had uh, uh, a lot of uh, informal seminars. And uh, one of my friends, uh, Peter Rosenrung, came in and said, I just bought this great book. It's about Clifford and Preston. And let me tell you about semigroups. And here's an example of a semigroup of functions, finite functions. And one thing about uh, finite functions is that they have a defect. So the defect is the number of... Uh, points that are, are collapsed. And uh, this has to do with their green relations. So anyway, I was just so fascinated by that, that I uh, tried to find a way to, to, uh, to uh, use this. <laughs> I was already, you know, many people at that time and said, well, what can you do with seven groups? Uh, there's only one axiom, there's nothing to prove. Well, we all know better. And uh, one, of, one of the things that suggested an application was um, uh, this fellow named Floyd Longsbury, who wrote about Crow and Omaha type kinship terminologies. His idea was uh, coming from linguistics, looking at rewriting systems. And uh, he found a way to describe these systems uh, in, in, in a, a formal grammar that looked a lot like uh, uh, a language, uh, linguistic grammar. 
And, uh, you know, I thought, well, maybe I can use uh, semigroups groups here because that's a lot like a generating equation. Uh, uh, I had already been working on uh, using groups to describe Australian kin kinship systems. They are beautiful algebraic systems where, where there's no uh, fudging. Uh, uh, they, they, are, they are definitely finite groups. I, I probably should have included Harrison White's uh, a book, uh, the, the Anatomy of Kinship, uh, which uh, again, I found on the shelf in the Mental Health Research Institute library. And I thought, oh, well, is that great? So uh, another person that influenced me is uh, Kim Romney also at, uh, at uh, Irvine. He's one of the people, few people I know who's been married longer than I have. He's been married for 76 years. Hard to believe. He, like I, uh, he got a head start. He got married when he was 19. So that explains uh, part of that. So then uh, Boyd Hale and Saylor uh, did write this paper in 1972, uh, trying to uh, apply kinship systems and in inverse semigroups, groups. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, actually, uh, looking at it, uh, I, I've redone, redone some of the approach that I had back then. I thought I looked at it. What was I thinking? But uh, uh, Sometimes you look back at, I, I look back at papers that I wrote and I thought, boy, that guy was pretty smart. But uh, uh, this time I looked back uh, and, and I thought, whoa, there's a lot of errors in there. And uh, this is uh, Lipscomb. It's one of the uh, books that I recently, uh, I've had it in my uh, office for a long time, but I recently started reading it more carefully. He has uh, some uh, talks about symmetric inverse semigroups, groups and with the idea of uh, uh, charts and uh, uh, so on, which I'm gonna talk about uh, shortly. Uh, let's get into a little bit of kinship notation. Uh, uh, the uh, kinship systems, which uh, the uh, uh, semigroup group people might call uh, primitive, Element uh, uh, is now primitive because it may be uh, not politically correct. But uh, anyway, we in the in describing kinship, you can get by with uh, these four systems: the uh, the Mars and Venus and are, are male and female, and the plus is referring to parenthood. Uh, it plus for going up a generation and minus for going down a generation. Minus means this can be interpreted as child. And then you and you concatenate together and you can specify the sex of the speaker and the sex of the receiver or the referent. And uh, so if we uh, put these all together, we can get a pre semigroup group, which we want to consider a uh, sub seven group of. Uh, we don't want to have all these symbols uh, and jumbled together in crazy ways. We want to have four strings of the form A plus or minus B, uh, uh, where A and B uh, uh, are the, uh, the uh, sex determinators. And uh, so in other words, we're talking about uh, 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 a man's father, a man's mother, a man's son, and a uh, and a woman's son. Okay, now uh, there are eight strings out there because we also have to. <laughs> it's there's two possibilities for the for the uh, a, and there's two possibilities for the plus and minus and two possibilities for the, for the sex of the speaker. So, okay, uh, uh, sorry about that. And, 
as in often, often uh, we, we like to adjoin a zero uh, to this uh, 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 subsummer group F. Uh, the, uh, now, now we could, for, for, for combinations that we don't like, now we could instead uh, have a partial, a partially uh, defined semigroup where the operation is not always defined. Uh, and there is a whole theory of partial algebras, and you have to be careful uh, uh, of just uh, putting in a, in a zero willy nilly uh, because it can destroy uh, homomorphisms uh, of the system. But uh, in, in this case, uh, I, I believe it's 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 appropriate. Uh, 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 okay, so uh, so what happens if you multiply uh, 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 two of these sex determinators together? Well, uh, it doesn't quite make sense if they uh, are different. So uh, uh, so this is a case where we're going to say the product is zero if A is not equal to B. Otherwise, A times A equals A. It's, it's a, uh, it's a, yeah, they're idempotents, in other words. A man's man is a man. <laughs> yeah, these, uh, the, the interpretation is going to be, uh, 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 the, the males are a, uh, a, uh, partial identity relation on the set of people. And females, they're also a partial identity uh, re relation and uh, they are disjoint. Hence the, uh, the product being uh, a zero of males and females. It's not that they annihilate each other. Okay, then this is a, a famous uh, uh, anthropological uh, relation. It's called the uh, half sibling rule. And this was uh, in invented by Lonsbury. Uh, uh, the idea is, is that a person's father's son, uh, first, a person's father's child, what is that? That's that's either a, that's either a brother or a sister, and uh, it doesn't matter whether it's your 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 father's child or your mother's child. We assume that they're married. Uh, now we know this isn't always true. Uh, people get divorced, uh, and so on. And, and and in many societies, they have multiple wives or occasionally multiple husbands. But for the purpose of naming these relatives, they are generally uh, merged together. Uh, now, I bet you can find a society where, where they are distinguished, in which case we erase, erase this rule. Uh, now, here's, here's, here's one that, that actually I considered in the uh, paper with uh, uh, Hale and Saylor, the unique parent rule, but I rejected it for, uh, for uh, what I now consider a bad reason. It's a very nice rule. And in fact, this is the one that really uh, will help justify the inverse semigroup idea. Uh, 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 here we go. What does it mean? Uh, uh, a man's, if A is a man, it's, um, uh, it's a man's child's father. Well, who is that? That's yourself. So if these, if the first A matches, uh, you know, if these A's are the same here. Um, and the same with, uh, if you're a woman, uh, your, your child's mother is yourself. It's especially true for women. <laughs> All right. And uh, now this one is, is somewhat uh, uh, specific to this case. Uh, uh, what what if uh, it, it's it's like the unique parenthood rule, but where 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 the first and last sex is di uh, different? In that case, um, 
if you're a man, then your 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 uh, your son's mother is your wife, right? Well, that that is a uh, what we call a uh, uh, aphonal relationship. It's a, a, a relationship by marriage, and there's a whole set of other rules that, that might apply to those. And so, uh, at least for the uh, this, and and this is what uh, Lonsberry did. Essentially, uh, uh, let's zero out aphonos. And uh, there's going to be enough other uh, relatives to consider. So uh, with these equations, uh, I claim that uh, uh, there's a unique set of representatives for the given by this uh, uh, semigroup that we have. Uh, one uh, is uh, of the form of uh, uh, a lineal uh, ancestor relation with all pluses, in other words. So it's your father's mother's father's, so on up and up the scale to Adam. And then um, the, the second uh, is uh, has to do with going downwards. Your child's child, child. And potentially, we, we know this is finite, but it's, in terms of terminology, it's potentially infinite. There's no natural ending. And then the third form, uh, uh, where there's, uh, oh yeah, I forgot about this symbol, this uh, plus circle. <laughs> uh, now, now this is something that I just introduced. There are various meth me that means uh, that means uh, sibling. <laughs> uh, Romney used an O for that. Uh, other people use other uh, things, but. Uh, uh, I kind of like the planetary uh, 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 a triple of uh, the, the Mars, the Venus, and the plus. This is the Earth symbol, <laughs> circle plus. Uh, okay. So anyway, these are uh, things like your 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 father's brother's uh, child. All right. Enough of that. Now. Now, this is the kind of data that I used to work with. This is what algebraists work with. You, you, so you, you look at what some anthropologist has taken years to gather by Rivers method that I mentioned before uh, in the previous talk. Uh, and, you, and, you, and, you, and you look at how uh, people uh, refer to their relatives. Now, can you can you see my cursor here? Uh, uh, this is a male eagle. Now, in this case, males are indicated by triangles, and females by circles. It's kind of a uh, 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 well. There's an obvious symbolism there, but anyway, uh, uh, there's a whole nother chart from the point of view of, of women, which is going to be slightly different. So uh, right away, you notice something interesting. Uh, uh, when you go up, that's a plus. Uh, and look at the father, uh, equals refers to marriage. Uh, when you go, this guy is an F, that's what we would call a father. Uh, uh, of course, other languages have a different word, but you know, it's some word that, 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 uh, uh, that will classify. Uh, other uh, points in the diagram. Uh, go, uh, if you go across, that's a sibling relationship. This father's brother, in English, we would call that uncle. But here it's father again. Here's an F. Uh, so uh, that is uh, kind of weird. This is called the merging. This is this makes us introduce the merging rule. Uh, where a, a man's brother is equivalent to a man or a woman's sister is equivalent to a woman, they merge together. Uh, uh, 
However, uh, well, let's look at this diagram some more. There's something even more strange. This is a, a Fox kinship system, which is a, uh, and just the consanguineos, you know, not the relatives by, uh, by marriage uh, so much. So uh, uh, it's classified as a, by Lonsbury as Omaha type one. So anyway, uh, this is the stuff that's really uh, amazing. Uh, the merging system, that's very common in, in uh, kinship systems around the world. Uh, uh, to, to people from um, other countries, which uh, it, it seems rather strange, but if you think about it, uh, in, in many, uh, many societies, uh, the, uh, the, the brothers stay together throughout their whole life, and, and uh, so they're very it's a, it's it's a sign of respect to call your father's brother, uh, he he's uncle, and he's not just uncle, but he's father also, in a metaphorical sense. You know, these people obviously these people know the difference between their their real father and their classificatory father. Uh, it's just like like uh, Catholics know the difference between uh, uh, their real father and the priest. But uh, they 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 use the term interchangeably. Okay, if we look on the mother's side, we see uh, uh, the mother's brother. He's not he's not father. Also, he's a separate term. I mean, we might say uncle here, but uh, that would be uh, kind of misleading. Let's just say he's he's MB for mother's brother, so we don't forget what what he is. Uh, so look at his son. He's also a mother's brother. And look at his son, mother's brother, all the way down. And this is uh, fantastic. And this is represented by the, uh, uh, I don't want to say explained, it's represented by the skewing rule up here, where we have plus female, that's a, that's a mother's, brother's child is equivalent to a mother's sibling. So uh, uh, hence we, 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 we get to recursively uh, 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 merge all these uh, children. And, and the interpretation of this has a good uh, anthropological interpretation. What does the term mother's brother mean really besides the closest a representative is the actual mother's brother. But if we look at this line going down, mother's brother and, and his son and his son, they're all called mother's brother. Mother's a male of my mother's lineal. So in terms of patrilineal descent, yes, the Fox system is specific to patrilineal societies. Uh, there's a whole other type that we can use for a matrilineal system. So that's where where where, uh, where there's, a, there's a different kind of merging, uh, uh, where we interchange these sex uh, designators. So uh, uh, we get some of these amazing uh, uh, results here from these uh, 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 these uh, gener generating equations. Uh, now. You might say, well, this can't be a real summer group. Uh, here I have list, I've already circled in, the, in my copy of this paper, uh, uh, a, a, a pro problematic uh, pair. I mean, in general, if, if, you, if you look at a, uh, at a symbol here, then their child, if you look, look at two people that have the same symbol, then their child also have equivalent symbols. This is a kind of equivalence. So what is the child of a father in general? Well, it's a, it's a sibling. Actually, they make a distinction between older and younger sibling, but in, let's just, let's just uh, lump those together. It's a sibling of one kind or another. Well, this, this father's brother, well, he's called an uncle. And so his children logically also are siblings. So this is, this is a first cousin which instead of being uh, classed as with other cousins, 
he's brought in, and uh, they're called brothers and sisters. And of course, in the patrilineal system, they, they are very close, closer than other kinds of cousins. So again, we all these four different kinds of cousins, these are four logical kinds of cousins, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're classed, they're, they fall into three different classes. All right, so uh, 23 minutes, I see. Oh, goodness. Uh, anyway, that's, uh, I, I'm going to have to say here, here's a grandmother in the top left. Compare that with this other grandmother in the top right. Well, they're both called by the same term, uh, whatever they use for grandmother among the Fox Indians. Their son, this son is called a brother. Sorry, my hand is shaking. This son over here is called a nephew. Uh, so this means that uh, obviously uh, it's, uh, something's wrong. How, how do we correct this uh, anomaly? Uh, well, we, we have to assume that, uh, that uh, some of these kinship terms uh, uh, cover several different uh, uh, equivalence classes in the SEMI group. So there's some sort of operation on the top that, uh, that uh, 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 gives the output uh, of, the, uh, of the underlying structure and it lumps some things together. Uh, so this is the way of uh, cheating, cheating death, not cheating uh, kinships. Uh, boy, I, I can see I've used up 20, 25 minutes. Do I have five more minutes to finish or should I just end right here? Okay, you uh, can take five minutes more. Okay, let me take five minutes. Uh, uh, yeah, the wonderful thing about inverse semigroups groups is that they are almost like a group. Uh, each uh, element of an inverse semigroup group has an inverse. It's not like a group inverse, but it's close. Uh, it's a, if the, it's X, the inverse is X inverse. So X inverse X, equals x. And on the other hand, uh, uh, x inverse x, x inverse equals x inverse. So this is a special case of groups. So the inverse semigroups groups uh, are kind of nicely in between groups and semigroups groups in uh, terms of gener generality. And uh, here's a, a picture of a typical, uh, these uh, inverse semigroups groups can be represented and there's a representation theory. They can all be represented by a one-to-one -one partial function, uh, which is very much, uh, the, the proof is re very much like the representation theory for uh, uh, several groups and groups. Um, more difficult to prove. Now here's the, uh, this path notation that I was talking about. Now, now uh, this Liscombe says it's very important. Uh, uh, over here on the right, you have bits that are that are that are cycles. You see the four cycle down here in the graph. So this is uh, just like in some uh, permutation group notation: five maps on a seventeen, seventeen maps on a six, six maps on a sixteen, sixteen loops around and hits five again. Okay. Well, how do we represent this long line across the top? This is a, a partial, uh, part of the partial one-to-one -one function. It ends at four. Well, okay, we, we, have, we start at 13 on the far left here. That goes to two, which goes to three, which goes to four. Four goes to nowhere or to zero something. And that's represented by this square bracket. All right. Okay, I'm going to skip this. Uh, this is part of the analytic uh, part. Uh, okay, the tortoise, uh, the tortoise and the hare. <laughs> yes, a hare and the tortoise. Uh, 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 this is off the chart, isn't it? Uh, now you can. Can you see it all? Yeah, this is a. You take an element of any sem any semi group and look at powers of it, and it forms a uh, 
uh, a uh, it goes around in a cycle and eventually ends up in a cycle at the end. And so the problem is, uh, how, uh, how do you determine this uh, if you don't know ahead of time what these uh, uh, what the length of the of this uh, uh, path part is and what the length of the cycle part is? Well, this is where we come to Floyd's algorithm. I mean. The application is uh, looking at random number generators. You can have uh, recursive formulas to get you from one sort of pseudo random number to, to the next. But eventually, we know it's going to come around, there's going to be repeats. And we want the repeat cycle to be as far as possible. And so his idea was, you know, instead of looking at memorizing, you know, a million uh, random numbers, you, you, you start out one where the tortoise goes from one, one point to the next, one at a time, and the hare jumps two at a time, and eventually they meet together, and that tells you how big, how big the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, this cycle structure is uh, without having to store all the intermediate items. It's a very clever algorithm. Okay, I'm going to the end now. Uh, uh, this is a little animation, which I will skip over. It's way too cute. Uh, now I did write a, a book about social summer groups. Uh, very abstract, nobody reads it. Uh, now this is a book that I really recommend. This Analytic Combinatories. It is a wonderful book. It combines, as I said, combinatorics uh, in terms of structures like partitions and one-to-one uh, -one, uh, partial maps uh, with, uh, 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 with a way to estimate the asymptotic uh, uh, numbers. Uh, that was the previous graph. I mean, it's, it's, it's a real tour de force. Uh, and some of this can be done within Mathematica. Okay, I, I, I do everything in Mathematica now. I know it's expensive, but uh, there's also a, 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 uh, a open source version of it. Okay, I better finish now. Sorry, I went over. Do you want to uh, ask any questions or? Uh, Oh, 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 I guess I better end presentation. All right. Thank you, Professor Boyd, for this nice talk. Let's have now a small break of five minutes. And then uh, Professor Mitrovic will share the last session where we can have a, some discussion about the topics. So let us start the last part of our of our today's event uh, let me thank you first of all let me thank you to all our today's speakers it was really pleasure to be with you and to listen to our, our talks thank you for accepting uh, our invitation to be with us you see among other things the small video we made of uh, our four cities. So, uh, so as you also saw, Nish is through this video presented through his huge and remarkable historical heritage. heritage. Now we will give a story about our city from slightly different point of view. Nish is also a city of music and music festival. So the most known and most long tradition is Nishville Jazz Festival. So in what follows, let us see short presentation about this festival. It is, uh, it is institution in our town and they are friends of our conference. But more important, let us see how they connect how they manage, among other things, to connect maths and jazz. I am inviting the presenter, 
Yeah, I think that it is exquisite. <laughs> director of this foundation, Mr. Peroliu. Hi. Hello. Hello, everyone. I hope uh, that the connection is okay. Yeah. Yeah, our, a big regards uh, from uh, Nishvi head office uh, in Dushanova Street in the city of Nish, Serbia. Uh, so uh, I will uh, tell you something about uh, the uh, our festival and about uh, the, the connection of uh, jazz and mathematics. Uh, uh, if uh, if someone uh, told uh, to 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 the other person that uh, it doesn't matter, it's not the same. Uh, Yes, uh, this is the truth. It's not the same, uh, but the, some musicians uh, uh, was uh, developed uh, some theories about the connection and mu about music and mathematics, and jazz and, mathem and mathematics. Uh, for example, Marcus Miller uh, is a very famous, uh, very famous uh, uh, American uh, saxophone player, and uh, I uh, try to. Uh, uh, and now uh, you can see uh, the citate of uh, his uh, theory and his opinion uh, about math, music, and imagination. Uh, math can be experienced as play much as music is just what's uh, needed to enlarge the tribe of creative problem solvers in mathematics and other human disciplines. Uh, Marcus uh, said, I am a jazz musician and mathematician. My skill set allows me to interpret musical experience through the language of mathematical structure, a creative problem solving. So, to me, uh, the notion uh, that math and music are the same thing is both terribly poetic and also too reductionist to be useful. Still, I believe uh, the two disciplines are connected by an uncanny similarity in the roles creativity and imagination play in both. Although the lifestyles of mathematicians and musicians uh, might seem world apart at last for me, the thought work behind them are more closely related than you might think. The magic of engineering with math and music fundamentally changes the way you imagine and create. Uh, uh, this is the part of uh, opinion uh, to Mr. Marcus D. Miller from United States of America, uh, who is graduated to Harvard Mathematics, but uh, he is graduated in music and, and jazz academy in Boston. So uh, uh, he is trying to, to tell us uh, uh, some his opinion about connection of jazz and mathematics. And I will try uh, to say you my opinion uh, because uh, everyone is aware, I, I think, that uh, the basically uh, math and music is connected uh, basically with counting, rhythm, harmony, and statistics and analytic. Uh, you know, uh, the, uh, every composition has started uh, on the concerts or in the studio when his recording is starting, uh, when is a uh, leader of the band or maybe maybe conductor of the big band of symphonic orchestra is counting uh, for the start of composition. You know, uh, the, for example, uh, one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four, now. This is the moment where the composition is starting. Uh, uh, it is obvious uh, that uh, mathematics uh, can be used in music, and it does it. Uh, rhythm and harmony is especially, is a very, very uh, similar to mathematics, drummers, uh, can you say you more about that? Uh, because they are counting all the time. And uh, uh, some musicians uh, using metronome in studios uh, to be precision, you know, when they some music. So uh, about uh, ways of math mathematics, uh, some, some uh, uh, styles uh, is a uh, statistic and analytic, analyst, analytics uh, is very important uh, to represent uh, maybe, uh, maybe something uh, uh, to create uh, biography of the musicians of the festival, uh, and etc. And uh, I will try to to uh, uh, 
to show you uh, next to presentation uh, in the few several minutes where is uh, uh, some uh, you know examples uh, with statistic and uh, analytics uh, uh, report. Uh, like we said, Nishville is an international jazz festival held in Nish during August on the plateau of the Nish Fortress. The International Nishville Festival, the most visited uh, jazz festival in Southeast Europe, has been constantly defending the European values of interculturalism for years and patiently not nurturing the musical taste and individuals. Confirmation of this is the large text Nashville, the European Face of Serbia, published in the U uh, magazine, A New Europe, which is published in Brussels. After being included in the top 10 best European jazz festivals in uh, 2017 by the renowned newspaper The Guardian, uh, Nashville recently experienced a special affirmation in these days or region of media in another way. The British uh, National Service, BBC, for example, published uh, an article on its portal BBC Travel entitled Serbia, the place to be, in which in the category cultural fix, uh, it also recommended the Nishful Jazz Festival. So uh, let's go to the next page. Uh, okay, uh, Nishville Festival, uh, we are trying to of course, uh, uh, to, 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 to tell you something about the history of the festival. So, uh, National Jazz Festival is a public city event of Nish, and uh, by the decision of the Ministry of Culture of the Republic of Serbia, an event of uh, national importance. Uh, Nishville is the only cultural event that won the statue uh, Best of Serbia for 2011, chosen by the Ministry of Trade and Services, the Serbian Chamber of Commerce, and the magazine Economic Review and won the award project of the future in the action of the Club of Business Journalists of Serbia 2010 and the Center for Small and Medium Enterprises. The Nishville Jazz Festival is the winner of the Tourist Flower Award uh, in Serbia 2015 as the best tourist event in the promotion of uh, tourism. Uh, so let's go on the next page. Uh, from the beginning, from the very beginning, in 1995, uh, 26 years ago, the concept of the festival, except for the more traditional forms of jazz, was based uh, primarily on the fusion of this direction with the ethnic traditions of different parts of the world, especially the Balkans. The most famous jazz magazine in the world, the American Downbeat, uh, rated Nashville as a festival uh, that, in the best possible way, simulatorly promotes jazz and direction created on the American continent, the musical tradition of the Balkans, but also a combination of the two styles, contributed a lot of the presentation of Balkan music as a new war trend. So let's go. During previous editions, uh, the festival performed many famous musicians. Uh, there are some of them are Solomon Burke, Billy Cobham, Benny Golson, Tom Heron, Original Blues Brothers Band, Ron Carter, Hanson Candid Alpha, Randy Breaker, Miroslav Vitos, Mingus Dynasty, Dr. Donald Bird, uh, Manu Dibango, Stanley Jordan, etc. etc. Uh, Aldi Meola, for example. Bob Geldof, uh, George Stone, uh, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this is a, a, a list uh, is a very, very, very big, uh, and uh, I will try to to tell you something about uh, uh, festival inside of that. Uh. Okay. So, okay, uh, this music when you hear the is uh, initial jubilation by the uh, Mr. Uh, Dusko Gojkovic, uh, who is uh, performing several times on Nashville Jazz Festival. 
and when I'm talking, the music is stopped. Okay, uh, this is the map of stages, you know, uh, in the niche uh, fortress and near to niche fortress because the, the two or three stages are uh, on the, the other side of the river of Nisheva. You know, river stage uh, is uh, in the amphitheater where is the monument of Shaban Baramovic. This is the ethno music stage, uh, world music stage. A welcome stage is the center of Nish on the on the city uh, of Nish, uh, but uh, the fortress of Nish is uh, something uh, uh, which is very important to our festival uh, because it is, it is uh, nature around and uh, it is uh, all the summer stage venue on my uh, on, 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 the, on the right side you can see, and uh, we have uh, about twelve stages uh, in the in the summer stage and about. Uh, uh, more than 130 concerts, uh, like we said, 700 to 1,000 performers. It belongs uh, uh, from year to year, and held uh, about 12 stages in this uh, in the uh, fortress of Nish. Uh, 20 uh, stages are, are the, 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 uh, about uh, uh, including uh, Nishville Jazz, uh, Nishville Theatre Festival, and Nishville Movie Fest Festival. Because of that, uh, Nishville, the last uh, few years, is not only music festival, uh, we are a festival of festivals, you know. We are subliming uh, uh, strip, uh, uh, you know, art to go jazzy, art colony. Uh, we have jazz ballet, we have, uh, like I said, the uh, Nishwi Jazz Theatre Festival, uh, Jazz Museum uh, in the Fortress of Nish, uh, etc., etc. And uh, this is very important to educated people. You know, uh, uh, only you can buy ticket only for the, the main stages, Earth and Sky stage. Uh, the, the other, uh, all the other programs are free for, for, for the audience. Uh, it is very important. Uh, because we are trying to educate the young people to make some new new audience for for the next years, you know. Okay, uh, let's go. Wait, breaker the sky stage, the main program. Uh, you can see uh, the picture. Space limited, uh, about six thousand. Uh, mm, uh, seats, but uh, it could be and ten thousand people. Uh, we have. Uh, experience with ten thousand uh, on the main uh, uh, on the main stages, uh, which is uh, uh, you know connected with the bridge, and th there is no pause. Uh, uh, you, you know, uh, one band is performing, the other uh, is, is is coming next. Uh, there is no waiting. Uh, this is dynamics, and uh, people like it definitely. You know that main program. Okay. Uh, Let's be quiet. Okay. There's several pictures. So this is about the stages. Uh, uh, I will try it in, in, in the next few minutes not to talk, uh, just to, to listen to the music and, and uh, you, you can read uh, about every stage uh, something. And uh, uh, this is uh, the second part about connection of mathematics and jazz uh, is a uh, is a very very interesting uh, because of the old theory the old theory of uh, famous uh, musician John Coltrane famous saxophonist uh, is uh, coming up next uh, uh, and we will talk uh, more about mathematics and jazz enjoy. Okay, mute stage. Driving okay. Movie. Yeah. 
uh, I need I need to talk so, uh, so, something about National Jazz Workshop. Uh, this is a very very important segment of the festival in in educational meaning. You know, uh, the famous musicians are are uh, uh, you know uh, uh, organize uh, are, are are teaching the young musicians. You know uh, uh, how to play and. Uh, discover some secrets uh, in music. Uh, it is very important about uh, 100 or 200 participations uh, uh, students of music uh, is uh, every year here. And uh, many of uh, famous musicians are teaching uh, our, our young musicians and the musicians uh, for, for you know, foreign uh, for, from the other countries, countries to, which is uh, very, very important for the festival. This, this is a very, very important segment. Nishvili. Uh, Nishvili in other towns. You can see some, some uh, other towns uh, or uh, some other countries. Nishvili and Dart, you know, uh, you can read down there what is really important. So uh, every year we, we have uh, many of volunteers, about 200 to 300. Uh, uh, they are really helpful, uh, the young, clever, beautiful people who is helping us uh, in organization. It is uh, uh, also very important, uh, impo important uh, segment of the festival. Up. This is uh, something uh, that I wanted to show you. Uh, jazz and mathematics called train circle. The famous called train circle. Uh, uh, as you see, uh, John Coltrane, famous saxophonist uh, uh, and composer in 1967, undertook an in-depth study of uh, Indian music. Uh, and jazz music along the study, some theories of Albert Einstein. And uh, his circle uh, resembles a clock, uh, in incorporates some of Coltrane's theoretical, theoretical innovations into a well-known musician section. So drawing was presented since 1967. And uh, as you can see, uh, this is a uh, very, uh, a very clear, uh, I think, uh, you know, notes, uh, D, E, J, F. Uh, these are the rules, you know, rhythm, harmony, syncopes, uh, and, and, and uh, the other things. Uh, and uh, this is very interesting uh, for me, I don't know. So, uh, this is uh, basically geometric representation, as can you see, uh, between the 12 semitones in chromatic scale, and this is the rules, uh, how we uh, composing and how we perform the music. Uh, uh, so for those of us who have on the graphic of Beautiful Enigma, visually and intuitively explaining the relationship between music and mathematics, uh, this is something uh, which is uh, maybe new for you, but uh, for us uh, is not uh, who is uh, uh, during all the time with, uh, not only with jazz, with blues, funk, and similar uh, musical, uh, you know, uh, styles, uh, rock and roll, and uh, the other urban styles. I suppose that I'm clear. So, uh, I was told you something about statistic, uh, appropriation statistic and analytic. Uh, th these are uh, some. Uh, uh, a new, uh, you know, uh, statistic uh, analysis, uh, statistic, uh, you know, 104 people, 25 visitors and, 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 and et cetera. We shall see because of uh, Corona, because of uh, COVID, uh, what is going up, going next. And uh, what can I say for you? Uh, welcome to the Nishville next year, uh, not next, uh, this year, 12 to 15 uh, August. We can see maybe for the end of this presentation, some photos, maybe some video. Uh, can, do I have some time? A few minutes? 
few minutes, I think. Okay, okay. Uh, well, you can see uh, what what was uh, the, the last year uh, Nisville uh, against the COVID <laughs> without the audience. You can see uh, it was it was very sad. You know, uh, there is no feeling. There there is no there is no public. But it it was good uh, performing. Uh, I mean. Uh, uh, summer theater on, on the Nice Fortress. Uh, it was uh, very, very nice, but uh, it is not. But uh, this, this is uh, what we want. Uh, main stages, for example, this is what, what we are preparing for this year, uh, 6 to 15 August, uh, the main program 12 to 15 August. And I hope uh, that uh, government of uh, Republic of Serbia will be, uh, you know, uh, put us to, you know, uh, what can I say, uh, to, to, to try to, to, to organize normal festival with, uh, with a lot of audience. And uh, from the end of, of my presentation, I would like to see uh, one video, video uh, with, uh, with the audience. Uh, I think that this is uh, one uh, who is... Uh, okay, uh, uh, because uh, there is no music uh, down there, but, but I will, I will comment it uh, uh, like a sports comments, you know, uh, I'll try. So uh, this is the, uh, you know, the, for last week, uh, the, the, uh, something uh, that we uh, looking uh, now uh, is uh, two years ago. Uh, with many, many, many of, uh, you know, people. And this is the main stage. This is a midnight jazz dance stage where the DJ is, uh, is uh, uh, recording uh, some black uh, music for dance, you know, uh, not techno, not house, but uh, soul, funk, world music, reggae, and something like that. Uh, New from initial hip hop stage because the hip hop is the level uh, de developed uh, with the fusion from jazz is very interesting. Uh, initial jazz theater. Uh, this is the part, very, very important part of our festival. This is Shakespeare, I think. Uh, yep, uh, as you like it, yes, Shakespeare. And some festival atmosphere in the city of Nish in the, in the Center of the of the yep, Christina stage movie stage. Uh, who like movies? Nashville movie summit every year. This is the atmosphere uh, and the fortress showcase is also very important uh, for young bands for young uh, musicians. This is uh, a welcome stage. Uh, Nashville jazz and book sessions. Uh, also the workshop. Yeah. I was told you about that. And old time is fest. Yeah, I forgot that. The, this is a very interesting. Uh, old time is fest of Nashville uh, every year. Uh, Striporama, also for the art lovers. Uh, street art. Everything is uh, in the fortress, in the beautiful fortress of Nish. Uh, Mr. Bob Geldof and press conference two years ago. Uh, one of the famous uh, musicians, Sean Kuti, on the main stage. Well, this is statistic. 3,000. Yeah, this is statistic, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank uh, you very, very much for a very nice presentation. You are welcome. You are welcome to New Nashville uh, on this year, uh, 12 to uh, 15 August. Goodbye. Yeah. yeah. Love you. Uh, it, it only what should be added that the Faculty of Mechanical Engineering is a few minutes far from the fortress. So we can combine for the next year uh, or next years when we start a series, uh, we can schedule the, our conference in the initial time. And uh, as they are our friends, we will certainly have certain additional uh, additional benefits. Now let us uh, let us back to our conference day, to our nice and inspirative talks. So, are there some questions, some remarks for our uh, speakers, guests? Yes, 
Yes, okay. I, I have a comment. Uh, I, I just uh, love this uh, presentation. Uh, I, I love jazz, and uh, uh, but you know, uh, as a word of caution, uh, you know, uh, we are here are, are globalists. I mean, uh, we're at a, a global conference, uh, uh, but uh, music can also be used to divide people. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, in, 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 in America, I, uh, maybe it's my age, uh, country and Western music, most of it just grates on me. Whereas uh, uh, to other people, it's wonderful. And jazz has a very negative effect on some people. It's almost like it's part of our tribal division here. Uh, and it's it's a very it can uh, uh, you know I'm a, I'm an optimistic person I believe in the enlightenment there was this wonderful book the enlightenment now by Pinker about progress and it's so positive and yet there there are danger uh, signs and even the, the things that we think are most unifying like music science mathematics can be used to uh, divide people. Yeah, thank you. I heard there are some other comments, remarks, questions. Or I might add, uh, Melania, I had a colleague who very sadly um, died a, f a few years ago who was um, a mathematician. Um, he was a scholar of mathematics and jazz. Um, and actually he developed mathematical models for the production of um, uh, you know, high quality music. Um, his name was Jeff Pressing. Uh, he was really a remarkable person. He was a composer and a mathematical modeler. And uh, his work is um, you know, an extraordinary blend of music and maths. So just reaffirming the, the comments made by your, uh, by, by our guest. Yeah. Melania, maybe you can tell us the name of your guest. Uh, he was, he's, uh, his name is Verulub. Verulub, he's executive director of Nishville Foundation. Thank you. They, the mm. general manager, general manager of Nishu Foundation is Ivan Blagojevic, and uh, they have a settlement in the center of the niche. Okay, some other. But niche, talking about music while you are maybe uh, preparing your questions or remarks. I have mentioned at the beginning that Nishi is also uh, Nishi is a town of music and music festival. So uh, there are several others. For example, the beginning of July is a core festival, also World Core Festival, also known. Then what is maybe even more interesting for us, there are festival also in July of uh, national dances student students' ensembles. So that is maybe even from our job point of view that also students from different countries, from uh, their ensembles which, uh, who, which perform, perform national dances are here guesting and for several days. So, we start with the series, sooner or later, we will be again in niche. I hope. <laughs> Other remarks, questions? Questions for our presentation? Okay. I, I, have, a, I have a question for John Martin. And I really loved your talk, John. Um, 
And that um, the K star, the, the the analysis you did of the rank, does that bear a relationship to the so-called shine rank of a Boolean array? Oh, what? So I think I. I so Boris Stein um, was a wonderful semi-group theorist um, who Melania mentioned earlier. I, we might follow off offline. I actually think it's very interesting. Yeah. So I look forward to learning about this. Mm. Well, can I tell a short story about Boris Shine? Uh, when I wrote the <laughs> book about seven groups and kinship systems, uh, he had a seminar in Russia, and uh, and he wrote me a letter um, offering some suggestions and so on, and and, and a very uh, charming letter. And we started uh, exchanging letters, and uh, and he actually uh, made it to America. He was being uh, discriminated against in Russia. This was, I don't know, in the late 70s or 80s uh, because he was uh, Jewish and they even took away his Cyrillic typewriter. Uh, so anyway, somehow he made it to the University of Arkansas. And, and uh, uh, I invited him out to Irvine to give, give a talk. And uh, he was uh, such a wonderful person and uh, he, uh, it's not always easy to learn a, uh, uh, any language, uh, but he loved to speak English because he liked to talk and tell jokes. Yeah, so the one thing I would say is that the, the um, K there, which is the number of meat irreducible elements, I think that's the thing that really expresses the underlying amount of information and the asterisk version, the number of dimensions is actually not as mathematically primary. That's more about our convenience in using this information in ways that have to do with certain psychological assumptions that are mathematically in some ways trivial, but could be practically really important. Yes, thank you. I, I, will, I will write to you separately because I think it, as from a psychological perspective, the, the decomposition was very similar to factor analysis with la a latent um, um, Boolean vector space rather than a um, one that's built out of the rows or columns of the matrix. Yeah, really interesting. I also have a Boris Schein story. I, I, when I was um, a PhD student, and I was working on semi-groups of um, uh, relationships. Um, I, I discovered uh, the work of Boris Shine, and of course, it's very important to semi-groups of binary relationships. So I took a course in science Russian so that I could read his work. Um, and it must have been after the period that John just described. Um, I think I reviewed a paper and he wrote to me, um, he made sure he found out who'd reviewed the paper and, and he, he wrote a lovely letter as well. And he was um, alive and well and, and living in the US. And I was thinking, mm, maybe I didn't need to do that course in science Russian. He was actually a very nice person. He was, I, yes. Yes, I, I have met him once in 1997 when in a conference in St. Andrews and uh, he was very, very polite to young uh, researcher, scientist. Uh, he gave me very good advices, which I still remember. So yes, it was a pleasure to know him. So. Well, I would love to visit uh, Serbia. Uh, its history um, is, is just amazing. All, all the uh, uh, unfortunate uh, uh, occupations that you've had, uh, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, your, your country has really had something to, to deal with. Yeah. So as soon as situation with this uh, pandemic became, become better, you, all of you have in, an open invitation to visit Nish and to be my guest. Be careful Maybe. what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> But actually, there are uh, there are some of you who who was in niche 
Paula, you can share maybe your experience of being, how is it being in Ish? Hi, Paula. Uh, hello, uh, I am Paula from Portugal. It was my first time here in this conference because I have lessons to teach and, uh, and uh, I start now to, to the conference. Uh, tomorrow I will give my talk about uh, one, two semi-groups of transformation that I have introduced in my PhD thesis. And about niche, I was in niche twice uh, and I enjoy, really enjoy to stay there with Melania. Uh, it is a, a beautiful town. The university is very nice and uh, uh, it was for me a great, great, great pleasure to be there. The, the, the weather, uh, I, it was in summer, summertime, and the weather is very nice for me because I was born in Africa, so <laughs> the weather is cold. <laughs> no, not cold, what, what, what? And uh, it is not a problem for me. Uh, the cultures of these peop uh, people from Serbia is similar to my country, the food is also similar, the, the dancing also, again, we have a lot of dancing in Portugal as well in Serbia, so it was very good for me to stay there in the house of Melania. Melania. Thank you very much and I hope I will visit you soon <laughs> again. <laughs> but the last time it was a time of conference, we organized a conference last time. Yes, the conference, I remember. So, I do hope that uh, this or uh, similar conference we organize next time uh, when we agree that conference to be in niche, it will be alive. Okay. <laughs> okay, is there any other remarks? If there is not, then we can close, I uh, suppose, this session. Thank you again to all speakers for giving us really interesting and inspirative talks. And we see you tomorrow in the same place and the same, with the same internet uh, address, which will be resent to you early in the morning. Early in the morning for any case from our uh, supporting team. See you tomorrow. Yes. I see that people are turning on their cameras. They want to make pictures. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dragona, for remembering me for that. Yes. Please. Please show up yourself. We are going to make... Hi. We are going to make a picture, common picture. That's a top monster. Just a moment. Uh, are someone else is going to show him or herself? Then, okay, someone else. Mm -hmm. We are waiting, or we are making a picture. So, bird. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Dragana, for <laughs> reminding me. Bye-bye. See, See you tomorrow. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 See you tomorrow. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. 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 Very good. Very nice conference. Very thank good. you. Thank you very much. See you. See you.